और कंप्यूटर एप्लीकेशन के बाद में आए ऑनोना बैनर्जी एसिस्टेंट प्रोफेसर फ्रॉम कंप्यूटर एप्लीकेशन के बाद में वी आर ऑनर एंड डिलाइटेड टू होस्ट द सेकंड एंड फाइनल डे ऑफ नेशनल सेमिनार जर्नी ऑफ आईटी प्रोफेशनल एंड न्यू अपॉर्चुनिटीज द फर्स्ट डे ऑफ दिस इवेंट व्हिच वाज ऑर्गेनाइज्ड बाय इंफॉर्मेशन टेक्नोलॉजी वाज कमिटेड टू अ प्लेसमेंट पैनल डिस्कशन विद ट्रेंड्स ऑफ Information technology, which will serve as a great foundation of upcoming batches of future institute of engineering management. We are very pleased to extend our warm and hearty welcome on behalf of the entire team of Future Plus Plus to all present here for this second day or this final day of this seminar. Today's event is organized by Computer Applications Department of Pitcher Institute of Engineering and Management. Computer Applications Department has the experience of organizing three national seminars, one faculty development training, and hands-on workshop on Python programming that was jointly organized with Calcutta University. Three distinguished speakers from industry and academia grace this event today's seminar of future plus plus lecture series is an extension of our previous efforts thank you ananya thank you ma'am now we will have the pleasure to invite on stage our most respectable executive director dr alok kumar gupta
uh, requesting students to have your presence. Uh, definitely, we gain some knowledge with the latest topic in life industries uh, like big data, big analysis, uh, how you analyze the data, how you collect the data, how you represent it, and uh, from there, how you take the decision. So, boys, uh, I am requesting you to have your presence and listen carefully uh, so that uh, our program will be get started. Thank you. A very good afternoon and warm welcome to all the participants on the second day of this two-day national seminar on journey of the IT profession and new opportunities jointly organized by Information Technology and Computer Applications Department. On behalf of the organizing committee, I, Dr. Anirban Chakraborty, Head of Computer Applications Department and one of the conveners of this national seminar, feel privileged to welcome our remote speakers, Mr. Shorojit Bhattacharya, Senior Solutions Architect, Mindly, Mr. Partha Shorkar, Academic Relationship Manager, Tata Consultancy Services, Dr. Odijit Mukherjee, Senior Scientist, Tata Consultancy Services, and Mr. Rahul Singh, Alumnus, BCA, 2015-18 Batch, Technical Architect, Blue Vector AI, for deliberating in today's event of future plus plus lecture series. The purpose of organizing this national seminar is to make all the participants conversant about the recent technologies which are empowering our business, research and development, healthcare, as well as impacting our social life. These trends of technology have stimulated us to keep the theme of the seminar as big data with data engineering and neuromorphic computing. Indeed, these two technologies will play a pivotal role in the coming times. Arthur McAfee, the principal scientist of Massachusetts Institute of Technology, quoted that the entire world is a big data problem. In fact, big data is an umbrella term that covers various aspects of handling data in large volumes, produced at a very high velocity and from a wide variety of types and sources. The applications and the primary goal of big data is to analyze large data to make more informative business solutions by extracting the hidden trends, the customer preferences, the unknown correlations and this data can come from different sources. It can be from social media content, it can be from web server logs, it can be from customer transactions in the retail stores. Data engineering is used to create the data infrastructure for extracting, processing, cleaning the data and presenting it to the end users in a more accessible and useful form. The first session deliberated by our distinguished speaker Mr. Shorajit Bhattacharya from Mindfree will focus on the role of data engineering in the era of big data. 
The second session will be conducted by Mr. Rahul Singh. He will focus on the tips and guidance of preparing for campus placements and how to excel in your first job. This will be an extension of the session we had yesterday where we had the opportunity to hear from the students of IT department who have been successful in multiple campus drives. And today we have the golden opportunity to hear from Mr. Rahul Singh who has worked with Deloitte and was part of the Fortune 20 implementation team. He will share his experiences as a developer as well as an entrepreneur. The third session will be deliberated by Dr. Orijit Mukherjee, senior scientist from TCS, on neuromorphic computing, a journey from neuroscience to computer science. Neuromorphic computing is an engineering where computer components are designed to emulate the human brain and the human nervous system more closely than the traditional artificial intelligence systems by using the spiking neural networks by utilizing the time factor in the spikes. Neuromorphic devices are more faster and achieve parallel processing. Moreover, they are event driven. Some of the potential applications of neuromorphic computing include driverless cars, smart home devices, augmented reality and even in healthcare systems where drug delivery can be controlled by sensing the changes in the body parameters like blood sugar, blood pressure, etc. I believe that the day-long deliberations by our eminent speakers will motivate all the participants to explore new avenues and applications of data engineering, big data and neuromorphic computing and will also inspire them to choose a career path in this domain. Thank you so much for your patience. Have a great day. Thank you very much, sir. Your uh, thought-provoking address set a perfect platform for our speakers to deliver their presentations. Now we are now we are entering in the first technical session of today, which is based on data engineering and big data. The next distinguished to honor us with his presence is Mr. Swarajit Padacharya, presently working as the senior solutions architect in Mindtree. He has 14 years of experience in top trial multinational IT service companies. Previously, he held the position of senior manager in Cognitive with projects in the domain of data engineering, data architecture, digital transformation with big data and dimensional model, data modeling with expertise in retail, travel, hospitality and healthcare business domain. It will be a privilege to invite Mr. Swarajit Panicharya for his speaker words in the specific domain. Hello.
possible and i thank future institute of engineering and management future uh, team future for inviting me and giving me this opportunity to speak to my little sisters and brothers okay don't consider me as a distinguished speaker from an industry i was also an engineering student back in 2008 okay i started my journey like you you are going to start in uh, you know upcoming futures maybe in 2 years 3 years or maybe in next year okay uh, so point is i'll get started with data engineering and uh, data warehousing data engineering and big data and please let me know when you are feeling that you will fall asleep okay i'll stop then okay so i'll get started with the first question right everyone wants to be data scientist okay how many of you wants to be the data scientist can you raise your hand please three four okay so i can assume that rest of all are interested to be a data engineer okay so that means i have my audience okay so um so what is data warehouse okay so i'll start with this way okay i have we have multiple evolution of data engineering okay so when it get, when it got started uh, the 1.0 version data engineering 1.0 version so we got started with data warehousing okay and why data warehousing so initially so if i think about it right i have uh, daily transactions at bank right so numerous transaction millions of transactions at bank in retail sector in healthcare domains uh, multiple transactions are happening right and then it, it is processed through oltp system right you guys know about oltp system no okay online transaction processing okay oltp oltp system is nothing but it's a it's a regular transaction that happens through your portals uh maybe through internet or i mean back uh, 20 years back or maybe 10 years back we used to go to the uh, go to the bank and do transaction draw uh, uh, draw amounts submit amount deposit amounts open fixed deposits right we used to do that and also in healthcare what happens so we somebody some of our family members get hospitalized okay so what we do we do Uh, we do a claim submission right we have made all of us have medical insurance right or somebody uh, have medical insurance or somebody might not have right and there are multiple companies like medlife and then you have united healthcare you have other other companies also right so what we do we submit our claim document to the tps right when we go to the hospital we submit our claim document to the tps and then they do a pre, they give us a pre approved amount right so it's a cashless or you can also do a reimbursement right so what happens so each each of this is a transaction right so basically when you ask for a claim uh, submit a claim request that means so let's say you have uh, spent 1 lakh rupees inr 1 lakh for the treatment of your uh, of your family members right so that claim will go to the healthcare uh, company who is actually um, basically uh, will provide the insured amount so you, let's say you have 5 lakh amount uh, total insured okay so now you want 1 lakh back because you have uh, spent 1 lakh for that right and you get that 1 lakh back how you do that you submit you submit that claim request and for each claim request you have a unique identified number right okay it's a key so you you send that amount to the tpa and tpa will in turn will send it to the uh, insurance companies right 
and they will actually dispatch the amount, approve it, and then they, you know, uh, uh, deduct some of the amount. We call it copay or coinsurance. Whoever is uh, familiar with uh, medical insurance or any anybody's parents, if you have medical insurance at home, right, you can check that there is something called copay. Copay, copay is a ten, maybe ten percent, twenty percent of the total amount that you actually spend, right? So basically, what happens? So if it's total expenditure is one lakh. And if it's a copay of 10%, that means you'll get back 90,000, 90, right? So this 10% and 90%, right? It's a transaction, correct? It happens to the system, happens by a system, right? They have a system and each transaction level that happens. Now, think about a situation you have in your locality, you have 10 hospitals, right? In that 10 hospitals, you have thousands of patients. Everybody submits their claim. Now, even if the insurance company wants to identify, so that means thousands of transactions are happening each day, right? Now, so this is OATP system. It is uh, transactions are happening through some UI, and the data is getting stored in a database. Now, what you do with that data? Of course, right? There are so many data. That is fine. So you are doing transactions. You are submit. You are insurance companies are reimbursing the um, amount of data. What happens then? What what they will do with the data? They will try to find out some insights. Let's say, for example, very simple example. You have ten hospitals in your locality. If the insurance company wants to identify which hospital gives you the more gives you more Big business. How do you find that? You have your data. You will try to find out using a simple SQL, right? You everybody knows about SQL, yes, sir. right? So you you write a query. You write a query. You you and you try to find out. It's a select clause with a where filter in the location, and you do a ranking, ranking of the total amount. Okay. Now it's a very simple SQL. Now think about a scenario, it's a global worldwide insurance company, what happens? So it, it's a millions of millions of transactions and terabytes of data, right? Forget about insurance, in banking, every transaction, every day, in every milliseconds, microseconds there are transactions, online, offline, everything. In retail stores, you have multiple transactions, so we are talking about terabytes of data right so now you should have a system system to organize your data in such a way that it answers your business decision driven questions right that's where our data in, data warehousing comes into picture okay what we do in the data warehousing so what happens we first of all to prepare a data warehouse, you have to identify that what are the answers, what are the questions and what are the answers that you are looking for, okay? So this is a very structured analysis, okay? So I want the answer that, okay, in the Asia region, how many customers are getting benefit of my new, uh, newly, advertised, uh, newly advertised insurance policy, right? I have a... So, in that way, if I have to get the answer, retrieve the data from this much of data, right, terabytes of data, uh, okay, terabytes of data, so what I need to do? I need to do a structured infrastructure. I need to create a structured infrastructure for that data to, get, to be retrieved from the data repository that you have. And also, if you want to do a trained analysis, let's say, Okay, last quarter I had this much, and in this quarter I had this much increase or decrease. So this performance was not happening correctly, right? So this particular uh, insurance policy is not giving me the benefit the, uh, business that I wanted to have, right? So this kind of trending trained analysis for this trained analysis, and if I want to forget about uh, comparing last quarter to this quarter, if I want to compare about quarter to quarter, last year's quarter to this year's quarter, what happened? 
right i need to store data for 2 years 3 years 4 years 5 years now you think about it every day you are every year you are uh, getting a transaction of terabytes of data tons of data right now you are storing data of 7 years right you need huge space and same way it has to be retrieved very fast right and it has to be structured in such a way all my business decisions are answered through that correct right? so that's where data warehousing came into picture okay that was version 1.0 So there are various aspects of data warehousing. Okay. So first, what you do, you have data sources, right? Now, when you start a data warehouse, you first do a structuring of this data. So you know what are the questions you have, what are the business answers that you want to get, and maybe there are other, uh, you know, the other insights that can be retrieved from the data that data report data that you have. For last seven years or five years, right? So for that, you have a structured database system, right? Which can host a data of maybe sixty terabytes, fifty terabytes, more than that, even hundred terabytes, right? So now, to now you have the data. That data needs to get populated, right? So this is a data warehouse concept. First, you have the model. You have the model ready. I'll come to that model. Okay. So now you first, you have, what you have to do, you have to get the data available to you, right? Data available to the separate system. It is complete separate uh, funding of the company, company's IT department uh, to get store the data into this data warehouses, right? So what you do? You have to first get the data from various systems, right? As Uh, Sir was mentioning, right? We have various data systems, right? So it can be. I mean, I, I was talking to talking of. I mean, uh, it, it's data warehousing was just five years back, but still now, the, uh, with the trend, it's a primitive era. Okay, even five years is a primitive era in in today's world. Okay, so you have to be upgraded every day, right? So when we did a data warehouse, maybe the various sources were. um uh, your database system uh, it could be a transactional database system maybe oracle maybe a sql server you have your regular transaction and you uh, get the data deposited okay you may have sap system where you have your uh, sap also holds the transactions or you can have flat files multiple flat files right so we first what we did we had to do the extraction of the data right from the various source so that that is called extraction okay first e okay extraction of the data how we do i'll give you a new case next in the next slide we'll discuss how we we used to do okay now the next part is as i mentioned the goal of the data warehouse is to answer your business driven questions right and now the transactions and the data that you used to have is a very flat manner right it's a it's a transaction of mr x this much amount this much uh, in, in that hospital if it's a medical if in this hospital in this locality we have this much of information but i don't know what to do with the data right so that flat information doesn't make sense to me correct so what we do we get the data we store that in the extract in, in the fast layer fast we get the data from various source system and store here and then we do a transformation we can do transformation for the for example as i was mentioning right in the first time right which medical policy gave me the best um best benefit right i can do a ranking i can do a aggregation total sum right so various aggregation okay so various transformations so that is in the next layer so we call it as transform okay and finally we load the data into the data warehouse using that transformation so the flat information which i was getting from the um, from the uh, from various data sources 
I transform the data using some tools or my SQLs. I'll come to that. And then we load the data into the data warehouse. Now your data warehouse is ready with so much of data. And then you integrate a reporting tool to it to get the business driven uh, answers to the business driven questions. Because if you don't do a, you know, it's just think about a CEO of a company, right? Right? Or MD of a company. Okay. So he will not do an SQL, right? Write an SQL. Sitting in front of his desk and he will not write an SQL, right? What he will do? He will have some report generated for him, right? He can do some drop down, etc. So he will have an UI, right? So that is the BI layer. We call it business intelligence, okay? So in the 1.0 version, we used to do the descriptive analytics, okay? I am still talking to the era where we don't have big data. I mean, we also already had big data, but it was not so popular at that point in time because uh, skill sets were not there and other things, right? And the next point, we also did not have so much of operational model operationalized into the industry. Still, we were talking about the descriptive analytics, right? This kind of trend analysis, etc. okay? So flat trend analysis. Okay, so ETL is the ETL is the heart of data warehousing. Okay, and in fact, data engineering ETL extract, transform, and load. Right, so that is the main thing. Okay, now dimensional data modeling. I'll not spend much time on that. Dimensional data modeling itself is a big concept. Okay. Dimensional data modeling, what I mentioned is that I need to design my data warehouse in such a way that my questions are answered and the data from huge amount of data set can be retrieved faster. So in that way, dimensional modeling will come into picture. Okay, I'll show you with a diagram how, how we can do that. Okay, and then we have various subject areas, right? Subject areas in the sense, uh, for a retail, for a uh, retail domain, you can have a, uh, you can have a subject area called revenue management. Okay, so in the revenue management system, how your business is growing and how you are doing a forecasting. So this much of sales I have to do in future. So this is one subject area. Subject area means oh, a data warehouse can be divided into multiple subject areas. In healthcare domain, we have claim subject area. We can have member subject area. Which member is claiming more? We, we can do fraud detection from that transaction of the member. And which member can be privileged? I mean, can be given more discounts for our policies? So that is a member subject area. Claim subject area is something like where we do the, uh, we, we uh, get the transactional data analyze it and which uh, business area, which location, which area my business is growing. So those kind of information, the, uh, how much copay, I, I was mentioning about copays, right? So how much copay I had to pay. So if, if, if I can internally uh, member and claim together, then I can probably get an idea that, okay, this customer, this member of my insurance company has given me this much of business in the next transaction I can give him more discount right so those kind of business decisions can be taken from the data with a structured subject area driven data modeling okay and finally I al already talked about the business intelligence which is the final layer of it okay Am I audible to the end? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Am I audible, right? Yes, sir. Okay, good. Okay, so this is one of the examples. This is one of the use cases I personally work. Okay. This design was made for a uh, very popular beverage and food company. Okay. So this is one data warehouse 
we created for them okay this is the design okay so as i was mentioned, so this is a three layer architecture okay so this is a architecture we created for them this is a three layer architecture please let me know if you are not able to hear me okay so till now it's good right okay three layer architecture as i mentioned there is source extract layer staging layer and access layer okay in the source layer as i was mentioning right i have various data sources i had sap sap you heard about that it was a database system and we also had mainframe data okay this database was in was a transactional database was hosted in oracle okay and then we also had text files okay as a source of data now think about that you can write an sql using the data that is hosted in database right but you cannot do a query by joining your text file to oracle file can you do that directly you cannot do right similarly you cannot do a join with your oracle data with sap data you cannot do right what is the solution i have an etl tool for that okay i have a tool for that okay it is a very popular tool okay it was a very popular tool it still is a very popular tool i would recommend if you can do some research maybe you can go to the udemy uh, websites and other things right coursera etc so you can do some research on what is informatica informatica is a tool you have the privilege to integrate these various disparate data source system into a single one okay you have the now you have an opportunity through informatica you can do a join with database and text files which in reality in a silo system you could not have done correct so now i have a system informatica okay so that company bought this tool okay now what happens now you have this three to three data uh, different data source systems we call we each source is source and uh, all source systems okay so it could be sap it could be data or anything we also had mainframe data uh, okay we integrated this with informatica okay and then what we did so we got this data from uh, regular uh, transactions right we stored that into a staging layer okay so this is the architecture okay first this is called extract layer where we do the integration integration with various source systems using a tool using an etl tool informatica and this is the extract layer and extract the data from different source system i don't have to care about how they are coming right i i, I have odbc database connections right i will just integrate i have apis so ready in this in this tool okay it's a user user friendly gui based tool it has integration with various source system you have apis for various source system you call it you name it you will get that in informatica okay you you can connect to any database you can connect to uh, oracle you can connect to mysql ms sql whatever postgres sql whatever you want you can connect terabyte you can connect okay and you store the data into a staging layer staging layer okay staging layer is a area where you do the data dumping okay so you get the regular data every time right so i while getting the data i don't have to do much about it right this is the first e of the etl extract extract and store is in your database okay so teradata is a database it's a database okay it's a mpp database it is much faster than oracle okay it it, uh, it, it can store uh, i mean it, it it its architecture is uh, 
completely different than Oracle. It, it works in a, um, it, it is called an MPP database, Massively Parallel Processing. Okay, so Teradata was one of the uh, choices to the companies where they, I mean, it's large companies where they spent more uh, to store their terabytes of data, 60 terabytes, 100 terabytes of data uh, for their data warehousing system. Right? So they first store that into the staging layer. Okay? And in the, from the staging layer, they write transformation logics. Okay? What transformation logics? You you can you have to write multiple scripts. Okay? SQLs, long SQLs. It's not just the uh, three line, four line SQL which comes into the UTEC uh, papers in semesters. Okay? It's maybe thousand lines of SQLs. Okay? So you have the transformation. You you have to join probably so you are just cannot imagine how many tables you are dealing with. So in a normally in a project, I mean I don't know about the students in new days, but in back in my time, we used to create a library management or a simple uh, I, don't, I don't know. I mean everybody used to do a library management in their final year project. Okay, and they only talked about four to five tables, and now we are talking about thousands of tables. So thousands of tables, you in each transformation you might have to join uh, twenty tables together. Left outer, inner, full outer, everything. Okay, you name it, you have it in the in the transformation. You all of your aggregations, right? You have rank functions, dense rank. Everybody knows, right? Ever in SQL. No? So let's say rank, rank is very simple. How, how you do that? You have uh, 100 students in the class, right? So uh, in, in a maths paper, who talks? Who talks? How can I find through an SQL? I can write a simple SQL like this. Let's say I have a table, students, students, Everybody can see this? Students, I have name, roll number, and marks. Okay? So hundreds of students. We have hundred students together. Okay? So X, roll number one, marks hundred. Another another record Y roll number two marks ninety five, right? So I will write a select statement, simple select statement, select name, comma roll number. from students order by so these are clauses okay these are syntax you need to learn okay sql is very important for your career whoever going to be a data scientist or data engineer please keep in mind that you have to be a very proficient in writing sqls okay because without sql you cannot sustain in the industry it's very difficult. Okay, in the, in the long run, long run, if you don't know SQLs, right, it will be very, very difficult for you to sustain. Okay, so that's in the syllabus. I know, probably in the sixth semester you said, right? In the in the in the sixth semester you have, right? So please make sure that you learn that very carefully. Okay, I used to hate that subject. I got a B in my semester and the irony is that my whole year, whole life is on database okay and when you start actually get the get the feeling of the database like you will love it okay so you you will get various op opportunities not in the career path okay you will get to explore a lot of things with so much of data available to you okay so you do a order by
ऑर्डर बाई मा टॉपर ऑफ द क्लास ओके so this is a very very simple example that i have given but this these are various transformations there are various transformation that you have to make okay and then you create the get the data into the data warehouse okay and then as i mentioned you remember in the previous slide i was talking about the business intelligence and when i talked about business intelligence also i mentioned that a ceo would not write an sql like you right In the, I mean, I know that everybody wants to be a CEO. In the past interaction, when they asked me that what is your goal in the next ten years, I said that I I'd like to become a CEO. But you know where I am, right? I could not. Of course, you cannot, right? Until unless you are an entrepreneur, right? Okay. So in the for them, what I'll have to make is a business intelligence layer. so this is the access layer i won't give any access to these layers to any of the outside users except for the data engineers and the dbas okay the users whoever will use the data for their business decision business decisions they will use this access layer okay so there are multiple tools available for that okay search in google Tableau and ClickView are the hot technologies right now in business intelligence area. Okay, please take a note. You get ample courses in Udemy. Okay, Udemy or Coursera. Don't think that I'm an advertiser of Udemy, but I learn from there. Okay, okay. Uh, you'll get a lot of courses. Tableau, uh, ClickView. Uh, so we also, I mean, in that project, we actually integrated. The data warehouse with Tableau and ClickView. Okay, so these are two business uh, BI tools that are available to the market, and depending on their requirement, they ask to integrate both. Okay, so in Tableau, so all this data that is available. So basically, see, CEOs are big shots, right? They don't want to like to see the data like one, two, three in an Excel format or something like that. They want to see, you know, fancy graphs, right? so you can see in that uh, in in the share market if you see that what is the trend you will get to see uh, various graphs right so all those kind of graphs are required for those uh, those persons okay they i i i, I mean you know initially i really do, uh, uh, did not understand that how can somebody look at graph and see what is happening okay when i was a junior right i used to see that okay my data is there then why graph is required i mean i used to hate those person who used to look at the graphs and all now when you actually move actually understand the end to end thing right then you get to understand that the representation of your data is also very important okay it's not that you get the data you dump into something okay and you go back right so basically the design in that data warehouse layer was made using three dimensional modeling okay in that three dimension with that three dimensional modeling you and that was integrated with tableau and click view and you used to retrieve that i mean we used to retrieve the data using that framework okay and so the ceos and this cxos right cfo and there are so many cs in the companies right now okay so they used to get the data retrieve the data they they used to see the trends etc using these tools they have the interface they have there in mobile they they, they have the, that in the tablet in laptop every everywhere um, ipad whatever you name and it, it was integrated okay 
and they have to see the data. Okay. Now there are a few things. Okay. So is that all? Is that all? So I said that you. I started from this layer, right? I said that you get the you you have different various data sources. You ha you have extracted your data. You dumped into data warehouse, and your uh, your uh, bosses are looking at it, right? Not your bosses, your clients' bosses look at it, right? So basically, it's an outsourcing, right? So there will be various companies. Project will be there for your company, whoever whichever company you work for, okay? So there there will be various companies, right? Various organization where various business like. As I mentioned, that uh, various insurance companies, various food and one of the very popular there are two very popular food food and beverages companies, right? We all know that Pepsi and Coke. This is one of them. Okay. So they will come to your company and they they will award you a project, award your company a project, and you will be part of the team, right? How you do that? So okay. So this data is for them to look at, not your companies. My mind tree bosses will not look into this data. They don't care about it. Okay. So now, important is this access layer. Why it is important? Because you have to give up role-based access control. Right? RPAC security is important because, as I mentioned, you cannot give. I mean, your CXOs. Or maybe the other users cannot see the data, all the data, right? All all the data. They cannot directly access the data data warehouse. We should not. There is a security concern. For example, I have in my HR department. HR data is also there in the uh, also there in the data warehouse, right? And I have my uh, finance person. Uh, they also have their own data subject areas i talked about right hr finance these are subject areas now hr hr have the data and finance I and mean, if what happens if i give access to finance uh, finance guy to the hr data what happens he can increase his salary right he has the access so hr data should not be accessed by any other person apart from the designated person who can look at the data right even in the hr group only the bosses can look at the salary but let's say i am the junior most person in the hr team and i can see my boss's salary that cannot happen right since i have the data that doesn't mean that i can access everything right i may have the data but i also have the access control on it okay so based on your role that access will be given okay only then only the designated person can look at the data right so that is our back control and there are few other things right you are getting data from various sources right various data sources and data can be junk anything data can be null you know null everybody blank data or anything right so name can be different your uh, i mean uh, there will be junk characters within that control m character can be there so various types of data so uh, let's say i am getting a uh, transactional data i have the transaction number in it but i don't have the amount or maybe i don't have the customer name in it so it's a this these date these records data quality is not good right i have to ensure that this quality of the data has to be perfect so that it actually helps me in retrieving the business driven questions right so data quality is also important for that so i will also have a mechanism or framework to check in this layer whether my data so i have a predefined set of data data quality right i know that what data needs to be present i know that a past, customer cannot have a transaction without buying a product right so a transaction must have a inner retail a transaction must have been tagged to a product without that product information a transaction cannot come so it's a, it's not a quality data right i'll have to drop the record and i have to send it back so i'll have to have this mechanism okay now as i said that i have got all this data available to me right so one day one fine morning you spend i mean one fine year you spend 3 months of your time 4 months of your time 
10 members of your team created this data warehouse can you move away no what happens to the next day's data or next week's data so data has to move on right data has to be loaded every day so i'll have to have an automation mechanism available to it right data integration correct so this data integration is so each layer will interact with each other right so first of this this data has to come here this data has to come here right and finally that will go to the access layer so it has to happen forever right one day you created you, you had seven years of data you dumped it and you are moving away it's not going to happen sir okay you have to create a mechanism that actually gets the data every day retrieve extract the data every day do the transformation and can be accessed by the business business persons so what you need to do we call it as orchestration okay so data orchestration is nothing but integrating all of them all of these layers together in an automated fashion okay so i'll schedule <coughs> so maybe sap data will come in the morning and excel this database updated data can come in the uh, afternoon and this text file can come in the evening right so i'll have to integrate all of them in such a way that i i mean I, i'll schedule my jobs in such a way that whenever this data comes gets into the system right so i'll have to schedule i have it i have some tools i can schedule my data sap data will come in the morning and access this uh, database data come in the uh, afternoon and this finally can come in the evening so i can schedule that and so we have multiple tools in this project we used autosys there is another tool called autosys there are various tools you can use control m okay wlm workload manager so they can stitch all these jobs together they, you can have a scheduler now so you uh, okay and informatica can also have this informatica has two different ways of handling the things okay we call it workflow so this is a complete workflow so one project can have multiple uh, numerous numbers of workflows okay so those workflows can be scheduled by informatica also time basis okay informatica has that capability that's why the tool was so popular okay okay so this is a basic architecture that we did i have spent too much of time have you have do you have any question on this no nobody liked it nobody understood good that means nobody understood or nobody liked it okay So let's move into the next next part. I was talking about this. I was no, very good. Yeah, I was talking about that architecture that we implemented three years ago in two thousand eighteen, two thousand seventeen eighteen. We implemented that, and now in today's area, today's world, I'm already talking about the version two dot o. This one in data engineering two dot o because that. that architecture has been primitive it's still there but new trends are coming right the new trends is nothing but as sir was mentioning it's big data now i talked about terabytes of data at that point in time and you i mean if you have the idea you can only then you can imagine how big the size is terabytes okay now we are talking about petabytes and what not all those bytes right you have that in the uh, digital transformation or something some uh, some subject you will have this bytes right one bit equal to this bytes kilobytes gigabytes so we talk about terabyte now we are talking about petabyte and what not okay so we have so much of data available right now and so much of data source systems we talked about static data source system at that point in time right we talked about sap static database static text file static one time now we talked about video logs we talked about now we we are talking about twitter we are talking about feedback youtube videos right 
various data sources and then you have CCTV footage also and in, in one of our projects we also had a use case to use the CCTV footage, CCTV logs. Okay. So we are talking about these various data sources, right? So now, of course, what you will do with the data? Simple answer, simple question. So a company has awarded you a project, right? So you have to do a data integration. You don't have any choice about that, right? So you have to become a big data data engineer. Okay. So, I mean, mostly I have, uh, you know, covered uh, what the goal of a data uh, data science is. Now, can you skip one slide and move the next So, we talked about data, uh, big data. No, uh, go to the next one. Because this is a big one. I mean, I have already found okay. So, um, why big data? Because I have uh, various data sources and data speed is high. Immediately, I mean, anytime a book. So let's say a uh, hotel, right? We we do a booking uh, through Booking.com, right? Make my trip, right? So it's an online immediate transaction, right? And it is a it's a streaming data. Stream. When I say streaming data, it means that ask for the real time data so i i i booked it today my uh, ceo wants to see the data immediately so in my data warehouse capability i did not have these op options right i did, i could not uh, show him the data that i mean show him a booking that has happened just now i can show him tomorrow but i cannot show him immediately right so there comes a big data solution okay so i have streaming data okay so real time data sources now we divide two portions so this is one of the travel and hospitality use case okay one of the uh, popular chains we have that chain in the eastern metropolitan bypass okay i'm not naming the company name but it's a big one okay it's a new one and it's a it's not an indian company Okay. Okay. So now we divide this data into two different formats. Okay. We make the operations in two different ways of doing. Okay. We have real time data source. We have con contextual or batch data source. The contextual or batch is the one that I can wait for a day or maybe half a day. Right. Real time is the one that I need immediately. A real time in, in the real time data sources when I get the data I need the data immediately for my analytics it's not that I just want to see that I want to take the decision immediately with the data that is available okay so that is the real time analytics so we have two different parallel flows running okay so now I talked about informatica informatica is a very popular and still popular but it's primitive now you have nitri okay so NIFI is one of the other other trend that you can also explore. Okay. So NIFI. So what we do through NIFI, we integrate the real-time sources. Okay. We have the API connected with the real-time sources, and we use Apache Kafka for Apache Kafka for the streaming data real time streaming data kafka has a different architecture you can search in internet you can get that okay uh, kafka kafka gets the real time data through broker and consumer okay so then that has a different uh, structure to it okay and then this information is real time information is integrated with nifi and coming through kafka and then we immediately do immediately do the transformation okay okay in the transformation we use spark in previous days we used to use sqls right now we write spark okay because of faster processing 
parallelism and in memory operations we use spark okay and you can also write spark sqls okay using spark you can write sql but the syntaxes are different okay and i talked about data warehouse in the version 1.0 now we talked to talk about data lake okay in the data lake what i need to do i don't have to create a structured data warehouse structured modeling my data sources can be anything i don't have a uh, uh, you know fixed number of columns so one file can come with five uh, five columns one file can come with 100 columns i don't mind that i i can store that in the data data lake okay and that is host and in the previous design we had everything on premise that means it was bought by the customer okay now it is hosted in amazon web services in the cloud okay it's a managed service i don't have to buy the hosting buy the uh, i i'll just buy the services of them okay i'll pay them okay so let's just like think about uh, your cloud kitchen in zomato right cloud kitchen in zomato or maybe uber right you don't have to buy a buy a car for that right uber also does not have a car right they just provide the service to you similarly the cloud they they have their own storage they have their own fleet of storage or something like that right they are just providing you the service basis of payment sir i have a question yeah, yeah. yeah sure you said that earlier you used to write sql hmm. but now you are writing spark spark and you said also you can write customized sql yeah no i'm not writing spark spark, spark, spark SQL. SQL. that is the customized yeah. sql so just can you brief for me it means what is the difference you said yeah right yeah i can i can tell so um, so if i talk talk about big data concept big data context in the big data context what we used to have we used to store the data in uh, hdfs and then on top of that we have the encapsulation of i and we used to write hqls hqls right so hqls in the back end used to run map and reduce right so it used to take time Back to reduce performance. Yeah, of course, it's better than the traditional SQL, but it still used to take time and resources, right? Now in Spark, in the Spark SQL, what happens? It brings the data into in memory. So Spark structure in memory means primary memory. Right? Primary memory. Yeah. Spark architecture is something like this, right? I have, I have a driver. Okay. And in the Spark class, so Spark can be and i have multiple task nodes okay and every every task node in a computer it has their own cpu and the memory okay so now i used to do using a single thing and i used to do multiple um, io operation read write operation in map reduce now you are in, in the spark architecture you can so let's say you are using 1000 rows 1000 rows now in the spark architecture I, in the map reduce i used to do the uh, operations using 1000 rows together right yes. so not everything can be done in a single memory we used to store that and sim simple os operation right we used to store that into the hard disk and the virtual memory and then we had the io operation so io is a costly operation right very much costly operation now what is happening i am dividing my 1000 rows into 200 rows and this driver is deciding my thousand uh, which task nodes it will assign so that driver also has same size that driver also has same size and task also has same size for example now if i am processing 200 nodes and 200 nodes 200 rows in parallel so my thousand rows can be i mean my time is reduced right i am doing parallel activities together right five persons doing same task with smaller amount right and then i am rolling it rolling the data up and sending it back so my time is saved and also my io operations are reduced right and only thing is that i'll have to add more nodes to it but there is a trade off with time time and memory operation io operations now when you 
you used to spend two hours for a job, in two hours you are actually used to working working with five ten jobs, right? So time is money. So we are writing Spark here. Here also, I mean, this is a batch data which is not required for every day. I mean, not uh, streaming. I mean, uh, real time is not required. This side we are using this architecture. What we are doing? We are storing the data. So this is the data lake. All this data first gets stored into S3 bucket. Okay. S3, S3, Amazon S3 bucket is a data lake. Okay, so we store that uh, two files in files, and then we do the transformations and store the data into PostgreSQL. Again, a free, so, uh, uh, free data source. Okay, free technology. Okay, and then my data goes into OR, OR modeling layer. So now, in the previous section, I, I did not do my predictive analytics. Now here I am doing predictive analytics also. Okay. So in the predictive analytics, what I am saying, I am sending it to microservices. Microservices, microservices layer, and the codes are written in microservices. My data, 7 years, 8 years of data, huge data is going to the operations research model. And they are running the model, training the model, and sending the data back to the... Um, Again, it's a, I mean, once you get the data, you get the real-time data back. Okay. Uh, again, Kafka is coming into picture. So immediately the processing is happening in the operations research model. You get to, you need to know the result of your processing, right? You need to know that. I mean, it's a real, real time. Once again, as I mentioned, so starting from real time, I want to see the what is the forecast. Okay. So then this output is again coming through streaming, again coming through streaming and it's getting processed here and then it finally goes to the reporting layer. And batch is simple, batch, in, in the batch I, I use um, S3 again, it's a bucket sign, it's a S3, these two signs are same, okay, uh, for same thing. So it's a bucket, so we call it as S3 bucket, okay, it's an Amazon web service. So basically, uh, the entire thing is integrated through something called Uzi. Okay, Uzi is another another work, uh, workflow integration tool. Okay, so this integration has happened, and uh, so this runs every day. So this is still ongoing. This is yet to be live. I mean, this is live, but it, it is still getting enhanced. So this is my current project. Okay. So can you go to the next slide, please? I mean, uh, I'd, I'd like to. So I have noted few technologies which are trending nowadays. I would recommend students for uh, whoever wants to be a data scientist or whoever wants to be a data engineer should learn this thing first. Spark. Okay, Spark, I mean, so if I say, if I give you an example of 100, 100 team members in a project, you will get 10 persons doing data science and 80, per, 80 persons are doing data engineering. So almost, we have to give, I mean, 50 percent of them has to be Spark resources, who knows Spark, okay in a big data data engineering project. So Spark, guys, it's very important to learn, okay. You, you have ample of courses available, you understand the Hadoop concept and then you go to Spark and you, in Spark you can write SQL-like logic and you have time. Guys, believe me, I had to learn Spark, at one, Spark one year back uh, during my job. Of course, I, I, I mean, it, says that it's a nine nine hour job that actually it's not okay so then within that within that i had to learn spark now you guys have time okay so this is the experience i want to share with you right as i mentioned that i i used to hate database okay but my whole life is with database okay so there are few technologies which you can actually you, you have time you can spend some time to learn these things these are industry uh, data science is of course a different thing, different ball game. I'm not that expert, okay. 
So I'm in the middle layer, middle class. Okay, so for the middle class people, you have to learn these things. Okay, not everybody can be uh, top rich, Ambani's. Nobody will have. I mean, all, not all. All of you will have to become Ambani's, right? So you still have to be smart enough. Somebody of you, right? At least seventy percent will still uh, draw same salary as me, right? So Spark, Kafka, Kafka for streaming. If possible, one one cloud technology, basic cloud infrastructure, AWS, Amazon Web Service, Microsoft Azure, GCP, Google Cloud. Any of the tool, AW. If you learn AWS, AWS Glue will help you in orchestration tool. Nifi you can also learn. Okay. And data quality, I did not spend much time on master data management. This is a huge topic. Informatica data quality is one of the popular tools. It still have demand in the market. Okay, and can you go to the next slide? Database, as I mentioned, SQL is must. Okay, so you can learn Snowflake, Spark SQL, Postgres SQL is another one. Programming language, you have to have have to have knowledge of any one of the programming language. Two guys, I mean. Java is still in the course, right? Java is still in the course, right? I mean, I did not learn Java in my college days. Okay, I mean, I, I we had that in the programming language, and knowing you take, I know that I I got A or B, so I I got passed. But I did not learn Java. But nowadays I have to learn Java because Java is coming back. Okay, so Java, Python, or Scala. Okay, Scala resources. Are not available in the market. Scala with Spark. Okay, so if you know this, know one of this, will be sold as hotcake. Okay, so now resources are also commodities, right? So getting sold is not a you know not a not an insulting word. And in memory analytics, I as I mentioned the Tableau or ClickView. So these are possible. And front and one of one front end engineering. JS Angular. Now, point is, guys, you can ask me that why you have to learn so many things. Nowadays, the requirement is somebody know, somebody has to know everything. Okay. So all skill all skill sets are required. So companies are asking for requirement for all skill sets. So I have already shared this slide uh, with sirs. So you can uh, circulate with the uh, to the students. Okay. So these are the technologies. And one more thing, I was talking before coming here. So there is a black screen thing that we used to have in your syllabus, or maybe you don't have, or somebody, some department might have. Unix or Linux. Do you learn that? I mean, uh, do you like that? Unix is very important, guys. Everywhere, even in big, in big data days, Unix is important because everything what I have talked, whatever I have talked so far, whatever architecture I have talked so far, everything is hosted in Unix. Okay, without Unix, shell scripting. Learn basics of shell script, shell scripting. Okay. Please make sure that uh, I mean. In, in your bucket list before you pass out in engineering or BC or NC whatever you are doing, Unix, SQL, and Spark should be in your bucket list to you know step forward in the market. Okay. Unix is very important. Okay. Unix, SQL, Unix I have not mentioned because it's already in your syllabus. Because it was there in my syllabus again, the same thing. I did not learn in my engineering days, guys. And if you want to know my advice, this is one of them. Unix is very important. Okay, uh, Unix normally people uh, used to get scared because of that black screen and those things, right? In the GNU, you can do a right click and you can change the background as white, so you don't have to get scared about that. Okay, so please learn Unix. Please learn SQL. Please learn Spark. Okay, and not only for data engineering, guys. 
for data science also you need that because ultimately all this data will go to the data scientist right so if you are a data scientist with this knowledge you know what is your reputation you know what will be your reputation in the market so you know it all so you know from starting to the end right so it's very important that we also have a solid concept of big data with this latest technology trends uh, learn about that okay and you have ample of courses in the uh, in the uh, internet again i'll not say the same company name um, you can do in coursera you have multiple other things okay so you can also attend some workshop if if it happens in your future or something like that so spark and all so they, 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 this can be self learned okay self paced learning there are so many courses you can learn this okay uh, sir i have a question yeah go ahead please sir sir uh, map grid is actually uh, it is uh, spark is more than uh, very better than map grid uh, nowadays is map grid is uh, learning is beneficial uh, actually not actually not i mean in the in the bigger uh, sizes right i mean uh, bigger data and all those things map reduce is uh, i mean i'll not say that see point is nothing is replaced in the industry okay data warehouse has not been replaced by, i mean uh, data warehouse has not been replaced by data lakes it's a complementary you still need descriptive analytics and structure analytics and you need to retrieve faster with the structured data you your still mpp databases are still in picture okay similarly map reduces map reduce job are still required but i mean for the uh, huge amount of etl data uh, uh, streaming data etc right you don't need uh, map reduce because as i mentioned i mean not only resources time is also money right so as as you can reduce time by smaller chunks of data right and in, in the same time you can run multiple jobs right ultimately you are talking about 500 600 jobs per day right even more than that correct so so map reduces are okay with smaller data but but the concept is needed it's not that i have to skip that okay for the students please have that concept i think they have that in the syllabus right yeah yeah So these concepts are basic concepts are needed. I mean, tools and technologies are there, but if you don't have the concept, then it will be very difficult. If you don't have the concept of I/O operation, what happens, right? So then it will be very difficult for you to understand the latest technology trends. I request the audience to raise their hands, please, if they have any more questions to ask. Sir, I have a question. Not really from the point of view, from the technical point of view. But uh, I know that you have had the experience of conducting and taking multiple interviews in your stint at Cognizant and in Mindbrain. Yeah. So you have visited many colleges and taken interviews. Yeah. So can you share that experience and brief guidance to all the students? See, uh, normally I don't follow a pattern. while taking the interviews to the students like you right i mean i know the syllabus because uh, i came from the uh, utec university okay so i know what are the things that are, uh, that are started here and how the students learn that i also know because i am also an engineer okay so i know and how uh, b can be ensured or a can be ensured or o can be ensured i know that right so basically normally uh, if you are lucky then you will get this kind of interviews okay and in that case they will actually ask you um, what technology uh, you prefer and you are best at okay normally if you look at the latest trend i mean more, majority of the trends everybody talked about c and data structure right everybody talked about c and data structure okay and frankly speaking guys c and data structure we hardly use in the industry so whoever is in front of you actually 
she would have forgotten what you used to write in C, right? So they will ask you some algorithmic questions, okay? So they might not, you might not have to be syntactically correct, but some programming, if they want to ask you to do in front of them, right? Write in a paper. So at least try to make sure that your uh, algorithm is correct and you do a dry run in front of you. Okay, so if I ask you to uh, do something, right, at least show him, write the steps, you will do this, okay, and even if you can write a program, nothing like it, you write it, but you show him the output by doing a dry run, okay, because uh, sometimes what happens, uh, people will mug up some uh, common codes, right, uh, like Tower of Hanoi and all those things, right. So they will mug up and they will come back and they will just write it down. But if I ask you to okay, show me the output, they cannot do it. And I have seen that in multiple cases. Okay. I would also prefer you guys to you know talk about SQLs and uh, Unix. And if I mean Unix is fine. If you are very good at Unix, then you can tell that. But if you are unlucky, if somebody is a very good at Unix, then they can actually uh, ask you difficult questions, but at the same time, they will also encourage to have you that courage to tell that I know Unix because they know that Unix skill is very important. Okay, in SQL, I said, I mean, SQL try to give SQLs, SQLs and data sets, try to see the complex SQLs, right? I mean, it's nothing, uh, nothing difficult. I mean, uh, I used to think when I was a student, but when I actually started, because See, I mean, uh, in my fourth year, I was hardly 21, 22, right? So everybody will be that, that starting from 18. So, I mean, I was still a student during my precious day, right? So, for, I mean, I still had that mentality, but I could learn. In fact, not only me, all the batsmen from various college universities, they could learn easily, right? So it's not very difficult writing a select statement and all. So I would also uh, request uh, to the uh, respective sons if you can conduct some of these hands-on sessions to the students, right? Practical classes, I mean, not just for the uh, uh, O class and all those things and 30% in the attendance and all those things, right? So if you can actually give some real-time problems and then you can ask the uh, students and uh, do that. And also, and if you can maintain a session social distance while writing that. <laughs> okay. Then actually that will be beneficial. Social distancing in that writing SQLs will be beneficial. Not only for COVID, it's for your career. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is, these are all and uh, what else? I mean. Uh, hmm, okay. Uh, sir, uh, I think uh, most of the students they have come from the Bengal medium. So I have a question. Uh, I have a question. Uh, is there any barrier? Uh, the language is a barrier for guiding the interview. Uh, it's a live streaming happening, right? <laughs> I'll not say the name of that RJ. Okay. I am from a Bengali medium, Bengali medium school. I spent three and a half years in US. No problem to that. Okay, have the confidence. That's it. Thank you very much, sir, for sharing your profound knowledge with us. Your session was full of enthusiasm and valuable knowledge. Questions, students? Any questions? Students, you may ask questions. Is there any welcome opportunity to hear from the industry person who has been? Actively involved in the placement process for Cosmian for a long time now in my selling smart skills. Then we uh, in sparse SQL, uh, we can store the different data in different nodes. Hmm. No, store Spark is not for storing. Spark is basically for operations. You are not storing the data. You are still storing in the HDFS. Your HDFS is still there. You are storing, retrieving the data from HDFS uh, by form of data frame or data sets. 
Okay, uh, you have the concept of data frame. Okay, so basically you can create. I mean, you create sub queries, right? In SQL, so you write sub queries, right? Those smaller operations can be stored in the data frame. Thank you once again, sir. Now I would like to invite Professor Ashok Torupal, sir, of Computer Applications Department, who is also one of the joint conveners of today's event on the stage, to please to present a small token of respect to Mr. Shwaradeep Bhattacharya.
So like my slide is uh, about zero to zero, and it's for uh, an introductory guide towards your first technical job. Okay, and uh, also like uh, this future cluster series is focuses on having or making IT as your career or industry of choice. So it's also like when you do manage to land your first job, how do you excel and put yourself in a good trajectory so you set up yourself for success. So uh, zero to hero, like uh, the zero first, it, uh, basically in computer science you would know that a lot of things start at zero. Array indexes start at zero, Cartesian, Cartesian planes uh, start at zero. So uh, and uh, all of us uh, will, would have also started at the same point. So the, the reason of starting from zero is uh, basically the things and technologies that I've worked in or uh, I am working on right now five years ago believe me I had no ideas about it and today I feel like I, I can call myself an expert in some of those keys and areas okay <clears throat> this uh, is not meant to be an uh, exhaustive or a comprehensive list but uh, or a guide but it's just uh, to uh, peak your interest in these subject matters. I think covering a lot of things and not be doing a deep dive into anything specific. The objective is that uh, later on you just take some points from these and then uh, do uh, or pick up whatever peaks your interest and then uh, you put yourself in those trajectories. Okay. Uh, and another thing is uh, becoming a great developer. Uh, it's not just a, for a software developer, but rather a technical uh, role. So, uh, like uh, Mr. Smarjit was talking about it. Uh, so, there are lots and lots of roles in the IT industry right now. Let's say he was just talking about data engineering, and in that uh, architecture that he was presenting, uh, you need multiple different people with multiple different kinds of skill who would be working on such a large project. And uh, as an example, data engineering is definitely one of them, but you have data analysts, you have business analysts, uh, you have BI or business intelligence people. And uh, these are just some of the technical rules. There are non-technical rules available as well, uh, QAs. So uh, if you're not familiar with uh, uh, coding or uh, uh, do not have a lot of technical proficiency, it's okay. Uh, uh, even a uh, surprising thing about me is that most of you are BTEC students, but I was a BC student, and before that, I was a commerce student, not even science. So uh, the thing is, oftentimes you you would be asking yourself like, hey, I, I'm from uh, not a CSC or IT, can I still make it into the uh, industry? I'm uh, let's say I never took uh, took up computer science, I never took up coding. Uh, will it be a block uh, blocker for me? So the thing is. Uh, uh, in this industry, um, let, let's say if, if we were in the medical or the law profession, you would need licenses uh, and degrees for that. But uh, at least for uh, becoming a technical uh, person or in this uh, uh, sector, uh, it's uh, it's you, your skills, your talent, your knowledge, your wisdom. Okay. I will try to keep this brief and quiet, and uh, I'll try to do a Q and A session at the end. So in case you have questions, definitely uh, feel free to <coughs> ask. Okay, uh, and with that, we'll move on to the next slide. <coughs> uh, I'll briefly talk about my uh, journey. Uh, so, I uh, like I said, um, I took up a BCA uh, and then before that Commerce. So, I wasn't exactly sure like where I would be going, but uh, I did uh, know that I wanted to uh, go in this technical line because coding uh, really uh, interested me okay and uh, i found it very interesting and believe me if you also uh, do that you'll uh, find the same um, right now i'm a technical architect at a startup called google ai uh, which is a google cloud partner we work with uh, specifically with just google cloud technologies which uh, in the previous slide you saw like was one of the major public cloud providers in, uh, uh, in with along with uh, AWS and Azure, okay? Uh, and before this, I used to work at Deloitte, uh, which, and that uh, was one of the uh, jobs that I got as a part of the campus placement from PM itself. Okay, it was, uh, and uh, yesterday's presentation, I also saw that this year also the campus placements have been good, so um, it, it was very nice to uh, see that. I've put in my email just in case anybody wants to reach out. And I've listed on a few, few certifications that I've completed over the past few years. 
and these are primarily the technologies that I work with. Okay, but the thing is, um, I did not know about any of these about five years back. So, like when Sir says in the IT industry, like five years is a primitive time. It's very true because right now things are constantly evolving uh, and changing. So uh, we just uh, keep on using this term called upskilling. And it's like we would have to continue doing that, where you train yourself and you learn and then you uh, pick up new skills, new tools, new technologies. So um, there are multiple uh, specific roles in the industry, but uh, I, I, I got very lucky and I got to work with a lot of different tools and different roles. So you can see that data engineering is one of them, but I also had worked as like an ML engineer or machine learning engineer. Right now I work for an AI company. I also happen to have like a developer or professional cloud developer certification and a cloud engineer. So these may seem a bit intimidating, but the thing is uh, a very big advantage that you have right now is that you have time on your side. So you may be at a first or a second year in your uh, college journey, but the thing is you have now let's say two to three years, maybe a thousand days and you can uh, plan uh, things accordingly. Now, there's this proverb like, uh, how do you devour a whale? So how do you eat a whale? Uh, it's a huge thing, but uh, you just start one bite at a time. So uh, even gargantuan tasks, uh, it's just like uh, you get started and then you get it done. Okay, and with this I'll move to the next slide. So uh, I've talked about my company and uh, uh, it's a very fantastic startup that I currently work at. The, uh, one thing that I really wanted to mention is uh, we will also be hiring a few interns uh, and uh, freshers from this college. So uh, and maybe after you are in your uh, when you are in your fourth year, maybe we can uh, will come back for more interns. But this is just something that I wanted to put out. Let's move on to the next slide. All right. So <clears throat> like I mentioned. Uh, uh, I, I wanted to highlight a few of the uh, resources that are available to you and uh, what you want to do is you want to learn uh, from these. Okay, so the first thing is uh, CS50 uh, and this is primarily a aimed at students who are not a part of let's say CS or IT but still want to make it into the, uh, uh, want to get into this IT world. Uh, it's a very introductory course in computer science. You may have heard of 101 classes where it's like a introductory code, but this is like 50, so it's even basic than that. But it, uh, it covers a lot of things, uh, and I would definitely uh, suggest this for students who are not in currently in computer science or architect, uh, IT line, but want to uh, get uh, into this uh, as a very good place to start your uh, professional uh, journey right now. So you would have to do a lot of planning, so keep that in mind. <coughs> The next thing is the GitHub uh, Student Developer Pack, and you will see like some of the courses that I've mentioned here is, uh, uh, or some of the topics or companies mentioned here are same with uh, what Snowjit Sir was talking about. But the thing is, none of these are endorsements, but these are something that uh, really helped me when I was a, a student, and this is just something that I want to uh, tell you guys, so you should know about it. But. So GitHub Student Developer Pack, it's uh, available only for students and it uh, has lots of premium uh, materials that's available uh, to you for free. So uh, if you do manage to get in, uh, do check this out and uh, will definitely help you a lot uh, in terms of uh, getting started because uh, you will see, uh, I, I encourage you to look it up because it has uh, tons and tons of uh, things. It even has a uh, domain name where it gives you a domain name for free. So you can even have like uh, your name.com or something like that uh, for free for you. Now, I myself uh, have uh, worked extensively with Google, but uh, this is something that I really like about Google Cloud is that they have a free trial program and they give you about $300 of credit to use Google Cloud. So, so for uh, it's like you can get hands on with Cloud uh, and you don't actually have to spend your own money. So let's say if you want to spin up your own virtual uh, instance, you want to do data engineering, data science, you want to make websites, you can just uh, use those credits towards uh, there. Okay. Uh, Sir was mention mentioning, the uh, previous speaker was mentioning about uh, learning various technologies. 
and I would uh, currently suggest that instead of you choosing a specialization, what you do is uh, you currently broaden your uh, horizon. So yeah, maybe uh, don't say that I want to become a data engineering and then just focus there, but may try uh, delving a bit into a lot of technology. So uh, a lot of options uh, are available to you. Okay, uh, a lot of options are available to you. Uh, so uh, pre code camp is a uh, a pre code camp is uh, the one that can teach you web development. Okay, and uh, edX and Coursera also has a lot of good uh, study materials, and I encourage that you uh, look up some uh, popular courses in there. Now I've specifically highlighted two courses here. Uh, one of them is a has a very funny name. It's called Learning How to Learn, and it's a recursive name. But uh, it's just something that uh, oftentimes we are asked to learn a lot of stuff, but uh, we just don't know like how would you learn it. And the thing is, uh, whenever you're delving into complex topics, uh, it, it can often be very intimidating. So maybe uh, just take a candle uh, at that course and then just uh, uh, try to. Uh, see what the uh, speakers are trying to teach there. And the other one is the science of well being. And this happens to be one of the, at one point, this was a very popular course on uh, Coursera. It was also called the science of happiness. And um, the reason I'm mentioning about this is because uh, as college students, and at every point in, uh, in your career, you always have tremendous. Uh, pressure uh, on yourself, uh, all right, there's always the uh, uncertainty. And I feel like your well-being, your physical well-being, your mental well-being, uh, us, uh, like, us as individuals are uh, a lot responsible for our own well-being and uh, definitely something that we want to take a look at it from a very objective uh, manner. So, uh, this, uh, these are recommendations, so do, if you do get the time, definitely look them up. <laughs> Alright, and now uh, we kind of like move on to the part where we uh, talk about uh, some of the things where we would, uh, which will help you get started. Okay, the very uh, first thing is you need a resume and uh, it's just uh, there, there are lots of resume workshops and you will get lots of contradictory or conflicting points like how you should structure your resume but uh, it's just like I follow this KISS principle and it's just like keep it as simple as possible I keep it as simple as possible so uh, and this is very important because let's say whenever you are applying for any jobs uh, your resume will be the will be doing all the talking on your behalf so it's uh, important that whenever let's say a recruiter or a person is looking at your resume, they can uh, just uh, know you by uh, taking a look at the, uh, that piece of paper or that PDF. Right? So uh, you will find lots of resources online for this, but uh, ensure that it's uh, short, crisp uh, and sweet. Okay. Uh, the other thing is, now uh, you will see, uh, I've tried to highlight a few things. Um, You'll see, uh, I'll uh, go over each of these points, but uh, you'll see like how I've not mentioned like uh, you to master like C, C++ or data structure because to be honest, uh, right now uh, these skills that the, that the industry looks for is problem solving while data structure is used as a tool for that problem solving, ultimately it uh, lies on you to uh, uh, crack problems and solve them effectively, efficiently. Uh, and in a very, what do I say, timely manner. Okay, so master one programming language. Okay, now um, you'll again hear like uh, whatever uh, language, uh, what language you would want to learn. You'll often see like you hear, you should learn C, C++, Java, .NET, Python, JavaScript, Scala, uh, this and that. The thing is, uh, it doesn't matter what language you're learning, but just learn one. And when it comes to like, let's say, uh, us, uh, uh, a lot of us are multilingual people, right? Uh, the thing is, when you learn one language, you understand the syntax, you understand the grammar of that language, and uh, it just helps you pick up uh, another language very easily. Let's say if you uh, know JavaScript, for example, it would be easier for you to learn Python. Uh, uh, because you already know the concepts of it, 
just the syntaxes may be different, but ultimately these are tools uh, that you use for problem solving. So, and uh, learn it well. Okay, so the thing is, um, we're often uh, uh, introductory courses are good, but uh, when you want to do complex problem solving, you need to know the intricacies of the languages, and that is why it would be very uh, uh, important for you to know one language and then you can just say okay if it's python i know python really well uh, for example uh, let's say you know a little bit of java but you may not know all of it uh, but at least there should be one language that you are very proficient with okay and uh, the next is like build real life projects and the reason i am saying this is because oftentimes like you, know, you build a library management system apps right the thing is even you yourself probably would not use this application but uh, try to build applications that you yourself may uh, use. Okay, uh, uh, let's say uh, a very simple application would be just a note-taking app. Uh, nobody else has to use it, but maybe you yourself can use it. Okay, uh, the other example would be a, a clone of IMDB kind of a thing, uh, where you can look up information about movies, so you can host it and uh, you can use APIs. And the thing is, when you build uh, such an application, you get to uh, delve into the details like how are things connected with each other and how I would uh, be building stuff so how the bigger picture comes into the picture right. like I said master one programming language but learn many okay uh, I would say that you can learn web development it's a very fun thing to learn uh, it has just uh, the basic part includes uh, HTML, CSS, JavaScript if you want to delve a bit more advanced you can take a look into Angular or uh, React. Okay, uh, SQL. Again, uh, I've highlighted uh, just a little bit of it, but uh, SQL is very important. And right now, almost all the applications that are made, they have two verticals. One is the application layer or the processing layer, and the other is the data layer. So, uh, like uh, the question was, Spark itself is the processing layer. It's not the data layer, and Every application that you would have uh, will have some kind of a data, and it is very uh, very crucial for you to know that how would I uh, read or, or understand this data. So, <clears throat> data is everywhere now. Uh, whatever application you're building, with, with, uh, or wherever you uh, uh, end up in, data is something that you would always be working with, right? If, if you are thinking data engineering, it's like your bread and butter where you're working with data and SQL all the time. If you're data analyst, your business analyst, you'll be working with data. Uh, if you're into the, if you become an AI developer or a machine learning engineer, again, uh, uh, those also uh, deal with data a lot. Okay, so, uh, and SQL is one of the, uh, what do I say, interfaces to query the uh, data, to extract insights from the data. There are other uh, tools as well, like uh, these are uh, backend, uh, and that, that just refers to like one of the programming languages. Like you can use Java, Python, uh, JavaScript, Node, and in the backend as well. <clears throat> There's a new, uh, what do I say, new kind of a technology uh, and uh, language. I would say it's called infrastructure. And basically, when you have things in the cloud, uh, it may uh, require. Uh, if you're learning cloud, you may have to deal with a Entirely different kind of a language uh, that infrastructure based languages. A uh, common example for it would be Terraform, but it's just something that you should be looking into. Okay. Don't think too much about what language to learn, but just uh, pick up uh, one of the things that you would want to learn. Okay. Uh, uh, SQL is definitely important, and uh, uh, it may seem like a bit repetitive because even though uh, uh, the previous speaker and I are kind of like repeating the same thing. Uh, the, uh, we, we are both trying to emphasize on the importance of it. So Linux and Terminal, I would definitely encourage you to pick it up because the cloud is powered by Linux. In, uh, recently in Windows 10, Microsoft also introduced uh, a, a Windows subsystem for Linux where you can run the terminal on Windows 10 itself. Right. <coughs> and uh, DevOps, it's like, um, Whenever you have a very large architecture, uh, how would you put all the things together? DevOps is just an amalgamation of two words, development plus operations, and it's just like how would uh, things uh, piece together. Okay. 
now since I mentioned that you have lots of time in your hand, do uh, do lots of online uh, hackathons and assessments, right? Uh, something like this, this includes like do hack, uh, hacker earth or hacker rank and I really like them because let's say whatever you learn in uh, your coding curriculum they are a bit uh, basic like uh, how would I uh, find let's say the largest number in an array but uh, if you go into hacker and hacker you will see that the problem sequence that they generate it has a very complex uh, and an elaborate question and it has lots of edge cases and it really encourages you on how you would think so in, uh, if you want to sharpen that muscle definitely take, take, uh, do some courses on uh, hacker rank uh, and ha hacker uh, so they recently introduced sql based uh, assessment and it was actually a while back ago but it's not just for programming languages but in case you also want to do sql it's available for you as well right the other thing is professional certifications and uh, what I mean by that is let's say when you are now applying for jobs how would your resume uh, be differentiated from the resumes of other people in uh, let's say when you have uh, your peers right and professional certifications are just industry recognized certifications and those include like certifications from AWS, Azure, uh, GCP, Oracle, Salesforce and <clears throat> They are like a badge, like uh, let's say uh, you telling that hey I know this technology versus uh, like you having a certification that speaks on your behalf. So this is especially true for uh, very experienced uh, uh, resources to have certifications but if you can uh, have professional certifications in your resume, I can guarantee you that that will be a standing out factor. Oftentimes, uh, the reason is uh, like let's say uh, I, I highlighted some of the certifications that I had machine learning engineer, data engineer, cloud developer. The recommended course or the tenure or experience is three years. Okay, so uh, now as a recruiter, if somebody is looking at your uh, resume and says, hey, this guy has this certificate, but this, this certificate like really uh, requires that you have in depth knowledge in-depth skill, you have hands-on working experience with it, that will be a standing out factor. And I would, my recommendation would be to, uh, to do that you get maybe uh, at least one, or if possible, one a year. Okay, and the other thing is learn how to work collaboratively. Because in the industry, uh, this is something uh, most of you will already know, but uh, whenever we are working, we are not working as uh, solo people, but rather we work uh, collaboratively. Multiple people are working uh, on the same project. So learn how to work uh, and build things collaboratively. Okay. The other thing is, uh, some of these would be unfamiliar territory to you. So right now, I feel like myself as an expert in cloud. But I remember uh, five years ago when I started, uh, there was this another speaker who was giving a lecture and uh, they were demoing something in AWS. And at that time I had no idea about what the cloud was, but it was very fascinating to me that I would be able to just with a few clicks, uh, deploy a machine in the cloud and then use it. Right? And that is what the cloud allows you to. And uh, especially now uh, with AI and ML coming uh, up, uh, you yourself may not be, uh, may not consider yourself as experts in uh, AI or ML, but definitely I, I think that uh, when you uh, land jobs in the future, you may be working on those technologies and tools because uh, that's an uh, uh, what do I say upcoming field, uh, field and definitely uh, it would be on your side that uh, you uh, know uh, AI and ML. And there's this trend, basically you, you would have seen, right, uh, almost a lot of the technologies use AI ML in some way or the other. Compared to 10 years ago, which were not there, but uh, how you would see like even with existing uh, uh, tools, uh, simple tools, uh, that is used, right? Let's say whenever you're chatting in uh, Gmail, you open up a mail, you would see that there are automatic replies suggested for, for you. Right? That, that's AI ML into the pic uh, picture. You, you have in websites, you see chatbots uh, integrated. You, you already know like uh, this has been used in let's say uh, every space right retail uses it for forecasting uh, uber uses it for prediction so we, we, this is something that uh, uh, 
the bill, right? And like I said, it's uh, if you don't know, it's okay. Like I said, time is on your side, so you definitely have, uh, have an uh, edge there that you have a lot of time to figure things out. So uh, one very crucial uh, skill to have would be uh, if let's say you want to learn AI or ML, right? You don't know it, but uh, you need to have that skill that like how would I learn this technology? You need to be self-driven and this is something again that would be a really uh, standing out factor for you. Okay. Uh, jack of all trends, master of none, it's just like uh, learn a lot of things right now like I mentioned, broaden your horizon first and then try to pick a specialization. So uh, for now I think it would be okay for you to learn a lot of things uh, where you are kind of like a jack of all things, you know a lot of things but it's okay if like you don't have a specialization in one thing. Maybe 5 years, 10 years down the line you can go for a specialization but that's my personal uh, recommendation. And the thing is, it's a uh, journey and it's probably not a destination but you would have milestones uh, uh, along the path, right? Uh, the destination is not that you land a job uh, because that's just like another chapter in your life. So similarly, when you're uh, passing out or completing every year, they are simple milestones. But definitely uh, uh, enjoy it when you're in, in this drive. <coughs> Alright, so... <coughs> Uh, just a, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm about to wrap things up, but uh, kind of like things we uh, want to point out is uh, do not limit yourself. And I often feel like uh, I've seen this a lot happening, uh, and that is that uh, you yourself will be holding you back, right? Uh, let's say one example would be like, hey, I don't know coding, how would I be able to do this? Uh, I'm not from XYZ, I, I may not be able to do this. Oftentimes, it's like uh, because of these, you may hold yourself back, but uh, do not hold yourself back. <clears throat> Alright, uh, time management. Like I said, you do have a lot of time in your hands right now. Okay, but how do you uh, manage time? Like, like I said, uh, it might have been a very uh, exhaustive list that I covered with. Uh, we covered a lot of topics and the thing is mastering each thing like let's say mastering SQL or Cloud or Linux it will take you a lot of time right? but like I said uh, you have the time on your hand and how do you fit these into your existing uh, schedule, existing plans and everything and how do, how do you be able to uh, make it in the world alright and lastly set goals for yourself right? set milestones for yourself you yourself are responsible for it and smash them. Right? It feels very nice and let's say, uh, uh, oftentimes uh, like you would see that people only have a couple of uh, certifications up their sleeves, but uh, it would be very nice that you challenge yourself. Right? Hey, uh, like let's say, uh, like I mentioned, some of the certifications that I did was uh, recommended that you have three years of experience with it. But what if I can do it in one year? Like uh, let's say, uh, well, people always aim for one or two certifications, but what if I wanted to do 10? Right? So, set goals for yourself, set, manage your time, uh, and then smash them goals. Right. Uh, we are nearing uh, the end, but some things that I just want to do is uh, recommend a couple of good books for you. Okay. Uh, Principles is, is one of them that I really like very much. Uh, and it talks about like uh, principles of life and work. Okay, the book has three parts, and I would definitely recommend that you read the first two. Uh, the first thing it talks about is why principles, and it talks about like why being disciplined is important, why having principles that you yourself follow and abide by is important, and what are some life principles you should be having. The author uh, encourages you to. Uh, set some principles for yourself but it, it doesn't say that you need to do this you need to do that but it, it kind of like makes you ponder okay and the second book is a very interesting read uh, i you may have heard the name it's called deep work and um, the idea is that uh, very deep focused work it's a increasingly rare commodity in a world that is very distracted and how do you uh, do uh, deep work uh, in this, uh, let's say, distracted uh, environment. So uh, that's that book. 
Okay. Uh, Pocket is also a very good application and it, it uh, has a very nice recommendation engine. So it uh, helps you connect articles from the web. Uh, you can read it in the app and then it will then based on your reading patterns, it will suggest more apps for you. Google Keep is just a very small to-do list and I find it very helpful for uh, taking notes. <coughs> Learning, I feel like uh, there are plenty of uh, resources available to you, but uh, just some sites that I've mentioned with you, right? Like, let's say if you want to pick up web development, I would recommend that you get started with Free Code Camp. If you want to learn Google Cloud, Google itself has a free uh, online training platform. Code Academy is again one of them where uh, if you want to learn any languages, whether it be like Linux, Terminal, Web Development, SQL, uh, it can. Uh, help you learn, right? And I think uh, that concludes uh, the uh, speech. We do have a Q and A session right now, so if we can go to the next slide. Uh, if you have questions right now, you can just uh, speak up and ask, or you can just go to this uh, slide uh, website, sli.do, right? You can put in your question, and then uh, I can see them here, and then we can uh, answer it. Uh, so. Do uh, take a minute, like uh, maybe like example.com. So, this is sli.do. So, in case you have any question, uh, uh, do ask, or you can just take up the mic. It's very nice collaborative platform where you can vote questions by others. It may ask you for a code, the code is PM in all caps. And it really feels like I'm back in the college, right? Uh, because not so long ago I used to be part of the students uh, yourself. So uh, this brings back so many nostalgic memories. <laughs> yes. So it, it uh, reminded me of his uh, six semester presentation. Okay. And I think also it reminds you also. <laughs> so my question is. Uh, Actually, there are three uh, questions I have. You have already uh, answered one. That is, being a BCA, what can you do? Okay, so you, you already told about this, that BCA or BTEC or anything is not uh, any barrier in front of your career. And the second question is, uh, time management. Okay, you, you uh, mentioned in your slide that Time management is very important. Uh, one one example I can uh, I can uh, share with all of you that during his uh, uh, semester uh, project, uh, he used to text his guide uh, at four a.m. Okay, so uh, that is one uh, example of time management. But uh, there are lots of things I wish to know from you. How how they how uh, this this uh, first year second year students how they manage time to cope up with this new te technology as well as with the uh, with this course curriculum. Right, that's an excellent question. So I still remember like what I used to do is I used to attend my classes and like at, after three pm I used to be a huge nerd and I used to go to the upstairs library to like learn some of the books that I had. Right. And uh, time management again is a skill that uh, is something that you would need uh, to do uh, your entire life. Right. Let's say uh, the previous speaker mentioned like he had a full time job, but even after that, he had to learn uh, new things and technology. So uh, I'm I'm sorry if I don't have tips specifically for how to do time management, but uh, definitely. Uh, uh, find out works, what works best for you. Right? People would often say that uh, be an early riser, but to me, I, I'm a uh, night owl. Right? I would uh, often like uh, I found it. I found it easier to be like awake till five a.m. rather than waking up five a.m. So uh, experiment and uh, find out what's easier for you. I do see lots of questions have come up in this slide, uh, and it's just uh, you can even upload questions. So anything that's at the top, I'll uh, answer. So um, Jeet asked, like, how did you set yourself apart from others who wanted the same job, right? And I, I I want to answer this very objectively, right? Basically, when you have a pile of resumes and uh, a, a recruiter is looking at them, 
they would want to know right like uh, of course there are these people but uh, whom would i want uh, that they to be a part of my team right uh, uh, so it, it's uh, of course important to know uh, the uh, be a skilled and a talented person but also another very important is uh, often times when you're working with team uh, they don't just ask uh, your skills and talents are not everything right one of the questions that asked is is this somebody who would i want to work with right because i've been working this with this person for months and months and years and years is this somebody who uh, i would want to work with and how do you set yourself apart so like i mentioned uh, professional certifications is definitely one right uh, being a skilled person uh, is another uh, in your resume try to list the projects that you've done right and something that uh, the recruiter can also like look themselves up right let's say uh, if you build an application you can just say right hey uh, this is the app and uh, you can just find it here the recruiter can then go through the code so uh, these are some distinguishing factors and ask yourself right let's say if you have you were to hire for one position and uh, you are looking uh, at your resume right let's just say you remove the name and you're looking uh, you're at your resume how would you want uh, how would you uh, uh, pick one of those <clears throat> um, what type of questions are asked in coding round of interview and this is asked by Saurabh so <clears throat> Uh, the thing is, uh, it depends on the role that you are inter interviewing for, right? If you are interviewing for a uh, data engineering position or a, like a web developer position, the interviewing questions, uh, the interview questions will be very different. And uh, like uh, he mentioned, right? Uh, there's no fixed pattern. Unfortunately, that is very true. Even like when I do some of the hiring and recruiting, I don't ask the same set of questions uh, again and again, but. We do have a few common things, and it's just like uh, lots of whiteboarding, right? And whiteboarding is, let's say, if I give you a complex statement, right? Uh, let's say uh, if I have regional uh, sales data of mobile phone, and uh, you are asked, like, how would I want to know that in, in what region which phone is the second most sold phone? Right, uh, or the third most phone sold. How do you uh, like? What do you think would the data structure would look like? Like, if you were to build an application that would store this data, uh, what would be the database schema? How would you query this data? How would you get the information? Um, lots of problem solving skills with, from a coding perspective will also happen. Right. Uh, let's say a very example would be like uh, given a array, you need to find the third largest element there. Right. Uh, you don't need to write the code for it, uh, but definitely you need pseudo code, uh, and this goes true for technical run. Uh, you need to do a dry run, like okay, if you come up with a logic, uh, how would you uh, solve uh, that question? Now, the example that I told you is very basic. So, uh, if you go to Hacker and you will see that they have an interview assessment prep also. So they they do kind of delve into deeper technical questions, but uh, the objective is uh, they they would need to uh, they whenever uh, they like a recruiter is looking at you they're not just looking at your uh, problem solving skills right they are uh, looking at your, let's say your body language how you're speaking uh, they are making other decisions about you while they are looking at your answers as well right and they, they, they just think like is this a good person that i would want to include in my company so keep a lot of these things in mind right um, Sure, sure. Actually, there's a bunch of questions that just came to screen. Uh, yeah, and uh, yeah. Uh, my question is: uh, Do you know you? I am very happy to see you because the year I have passed out, you joined me. He is also a previous alumnus. <laughs> you are also an alumnus, and I am also. <laughs> so my question is to you, uh, to you. Uh, you have faced one question while you uh, sit for campusing that was uh, introduce yourself or why should we hire you? How do you advise your juniors that how they can and which important points should they include uh, with, uh, while they are answering these two specific questions asked by each other? 
Uh, yeah, that's actually a very good question because in the interview, like I mentioned, you don't have a pattern, but then you see like some questions that can keep coming up, right? Like, uh, tell me about yourself. Uh, uh, that's one of them. Like, uh, why should I hire you? That's another. Where do you see yourself in X years? That would be another question, right? And uh, to be honest, like uh, when I uh, interviewed myself, I also did not have a static answer to this. It was a evolving answer. But be honest uh, about yourself, right? Um, again, uh, not too honest so that they reject you uh, just right there and there. But uh, be honest and truthful about yourself. So, uh, the interview is looking for points like, hey, uh, this is the uh, for offending and uh, right now you would see the person interviewing you is the one who would, uh, you would be working with there on their team or at least uh, that holds true uh, and it's just not recruiters doing the interview so uh, the person who's asking you uh, it, 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 it's kind of like asking like is this the person who I would want to have on my team with is this some, somebody I would want to work with so uh, like tell me about yourself should I have an honest uh, description about you uh, keep uh, uh, be well prepared for that uh, and give points that uh, or say things that would like uh, try uh, would distinguish you from others right uh, again like I mentioned uh, you yourself uh, take a look at this very objectively where uh, you collect such answers from your peers and then uh, how would you uh, rank or decide what's the best one and this, I feel, is a very objective question and the, uh, it, to be honest, depends a lot on the uh, recruiter or interviewer because not everybody would be ha having the same thought process. So, uh, know, like, uh, what you're, know the scenario, assess the scenario as well and then answer accordingly. Alright? Uh, there's one question that I would just like to answer how to crack the coding interview easily. Unfortunately, I wish uh, I had an answer for this. Uh, th th I mean, especially when you're in the uh, IT field, like, how to do XYZ easily, it just like uh, comes with uh, uh, proficiency and ex experience. So if you're looking for shortcuts, I cannot give you, but uh, I would definitely recommend like you become a master at something, right? Let's say, for example, paint, painting. Um, there's this story, right? Uh, let's say a paint, painter painted a very beautiful portrait in like 15 minutes, and then he charged an absurd fee to the uh, customer, and then the customer was like, "Hey, it only took you 15 minutes. Why are you charging me this much?" And then he said, "Like, uh, it took me 15 minutes to make this portrait, but it took me years to learn it." So similarly, that will hold true for you as well. So if you want to uh, crack coding interviews easily. Just uh, uh, get good at coding. Thank you so much for all for sharing your reflective knowledge with us. Um, Any final questions that you guys have? Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, I, I, this is not a question, but. Hello, sir. Uh, is there any kind of difference between placement teams uh, from your time and ours? Uh, I don't really know what the current placement scenario looks like, but I, I can tell you uh, right now. Um, so, uh, this is a very hard question, and um, colleges uh, will impart knowledge and education to you, but often uh, you can go out of uh, get out of college placement as well. So. Uh, you'll get a good job out of uh, college campus placements, but uh, if you go out, uh, you can maybe like look for other better opportunities as well. So uh, I don't know what the current scenario is right now, but uh, from an industry perspective, I can tell you, uh, freshers are like uh, people uh, are kind of like hesitant to hire freshers because often times the first few months are just uh, spent to just train and upskill them. So uh, if you want to get jobs, uh, I would definitely say that uh, you kind of like do the upskilling yourself. A degree is just one bullet point in your resume, right? Uh, and then just followed by the number. And another thing is like uh, in my last four years, 
nobody has asked me like what's your degree or how much marks did you get in 10th to 12th right it was often like uh, your skills talent work experience uh, your knowledge your wisdom that is the one that's assessed in interviews so keep that in mind for, for yeah. interviews and take some and i'll take just one more question from here uh, yes yeah. 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 Just due to time constraint, we are not allowing any more questions. Actually, it shows how interactive the session is. <laughs> it was really an amazing session. And thanks for taking out. We are waiting for 45 minutes now. So, we have to wrap it up. But obviously, the questions are posted there. And I believe Rahul will get back to you. Yeah. Just one small observation. He has already mentioned. It's a very inspirational motivation for all of you. I can still remember the first day. He is coming from a commerce background, mind you. He did BCA, so there are so many students who are going for BCA and all. I'm coming from art background, I'm coming from commerce background, it's preoccupied. But he, is, he has proved that even if from coming from commerce background, non science background, you can excel not only in your career, but obviously he is a master of coding. So that's a very great opportunity to learn from somebody. Well, seeing it all. So, we can see. Thanks for taking the honor and uh, wish you very all the best for your brilliant future ahead. Thank you. Uh, I'll just end with that. I've left out my email and I'll be around. So, uh, we couldn't do the QA, but uh, I'll be around in case anybody has questions. Feel free to uh, walk it through. Right? Okay, thanks very much. Now I'd like to uh, request our Shubhasya Sadhikari Sir of Computer Applications Department to present a, to present a small token of appreciation to Rahul Singh.
Now we would like to call Professor Treyushi Bhattacharya from Computer Application Department to welcome our honorable guest, Mr. Pathu Sharkar Vita Bhupe. Now I request Mr. Pathu Sharkar to share his views and enrich the audience. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for the opportunities by the institute and uh, thank you for the initiative. Um, in the technology front, when we are working and we are facing a tremendous challenge in the transformation in the technology that is happening. And um, as a part of it, what we feel is uh, the role of institutes are very important in this transformation journey. And that is where this type of initiative is really, really going to help us. It is not just, you know, industry, uh, the institute is helping their students. In turn, we are going to get benefit out of it. This is very, very important stage. And uh, uh, today, uh, we will be hearing from one of our eminent scientists, Arjit Mukherjee, their, their, the, the team of, uh, he is uh, working in, uh, one of the very, very niche area that's uh, heavily under research. And um, this particular area is, uh, you know, some people think that it is very fancy. Okay, it's not at, at all fancy. This particular area is getting developed because of the need. Um, we'll talk about and we'll hear about all these things from Dr. Arijit Mukherjee, uh, um, you know, uh, a little short after, after you know, I leave the stage to him. Um, but you know, it is for all of us. It is very important to understand the transformation that is going on in the technology space, adopt the changes, and prepare themselves to uh, be the front runner of it. A um, lot of students are studying, and uh, you know, we have a tremendous confidence on, on the all the new generation students, all the new talents that we are carrying. Um, we strongly believe that uh, we are going to carry the leadership position in the industry. Um, but it is, uh, you know, that is what I, I just wanted to thank the Institute once again uh, for taking this type of initiative. And uh, I am sure this is going to help all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for your valuable work. Now I, I would request Professor Amit Kumar Dev from Computer Application Department to present a token of appreciation to our honored guest, Mr. Parthu Sharkar. In addition, I cordially invite our honorable guest, Dr. Arjit Mukherjee from Tata Consultancy Services to grace the stage. <laughs> now I request Professor Vinishna Patro from Computer Application Department to offer a bouquet to our esteemed guest. conferences 
and journals around 40 published and 20 graduate patents and the Google Scholar 18 days coding with over 800 citations. His research interest involves neuromorphic computing, distributed age system, cognitive computing. And he is an executive committee member of IEEE Computer Society Kolkata chapter. To dive onto the technology advancement in neuromorphic computing, now Dr. Aurelius Mukherjee will share his extensive knowledge on the same and enlighten us.
Okay, so sorry for the technical problem. So I guess you can hear it now. Uh, see it clearly, right? Okay. <coughs> so um, I'll be talking briefly about uh, neuromorphic computing that is an evolving area. It's pre pretty much uh, nascent as of now. In fact, if you go to the market, you won't be able to buy a single neuromorphic chip. They aren't produced uh, globally and you can't buy them off the market, off the shelf. There are no neuromorphic computers that you can buy in Amazon or any other uh, from any other brand. It's still under research and it's hoped that within the next five years or something, these chips will hit the market, uh, especially in certain industries like manufacturing, automotive, space, uh, this system is going to be uh, become very big. Okay. So I come, come from a background where uh, we talk about edge computing a lot. So maybe you have heard about cloud and all those things in your previous sessions. So that is the topmost layer is the cloud. So all your main AI and machine learning things typically go on in, in that area, the cloud. So all your data science, data engineering, data cleansing, data processing that happens mainly in the cloud. But nowadays, the industry thinks that below the cloud, there are several other layers which are equally important and in, at times they are more important, more necessary to use those layers for performing certain types of computation. And by those layers, I mean this is a fog layer which is something like your uh, base stations. Like for example, you have your cell phones connected to the towers, the cell towers. So the cell towers can be our fog layer. We can do certain part of computation there. And then the edge, the network edge, things that are at your home, within your own premises, things like your cell phone, your PlayStation, other sensors or gateways that are there around at your home, those things are also part of a certain type of computing called the edge computing. So edge devices. So this is the this is the landscape of edge devices. Where do we need them? We need them in various industries from aerospace to telecom to retail, manufacturing, everywhere. These edge, edge devices, say for example in manufacturing sector or retail sector, specifically Amazon warehousing. Nowadays you see that people are packing things in, inside Amazon warehouses. There will be people who are moving between the aisles and they are packing all the things that you have ordered online. What if these packing, this, this packing and moving the moving things between aisles from the from the aisles, from the racks to the packing station is done by robots? So that is where edge computing is used. Robots are my edge devices. I'll give you a couple of examples. This one, particularly, uh, was a challenge that was held by, at UAE in 2019-2020 and one of our teams participated in that. This, this, is a, this is a composition of three challenges. So the first challenge is there is an enemy drone that is carrying something, some unidentified object. This is a simulation by the way. And you have a friendly drone, the green one, which is supposed to track that enemy drone, follow it, grab the object and take the object down to a bin and then land safety. So you see the green drone, that is a friendly drone, tracks the red drone, carries the object down, dumps it in a bin and then it will land there. This was challenge number one. Then we will go to challenge number two. I will come, why, uh, come to the point why these things are important. In challenge number two, it is specifically for the construction industry. So you have a wall. There is, a, there is a wall and there is a pattern that you are supposed to create. Now there are ground vehicles, this is a ground vehicle and there are drones who are supposed to collaborate jointly together, work together 
to carry those bricks those are plastic by the way carry those bricks and create this wall using this exclusive pattern so you can think that these drones drones and robots will have to talk among themselves who is supposed to carry what who is supposed to take the uh, uh, place the lower bricks and who is supposed to place the upper bricks so these drones and robots will have to communicate challenge number 3 is a disaster scenario very common all over the world so there is a fire in a tall tower this building robots and drones are supposed to douse the fire now if you go by the statistics of fire industry there is a huge number of in injuries and deaths that happen every year because of such fire hazards so why cannot we use robots and drones to do this hazardous job now here again there is a ground vehicle that cannot climb the stairs but it can carry some heavy load it can detect the fire and it can spray some some chemical on the fire then you have the aerial vehicles who can climb up stairs who can also detect the fire maybe they cannot the aerial vehicles cannot carry heavier uh, fire extinguishers but they can do some 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 bits of that now challenge 1 2 3 and everything mixed together was the challenge the fourth challenge the grand challenge so this was one of the challenge that industry has been preparing for this is a necessity in the industry the second one is about satellites so this type of satellites sorry this is called a cubesat or a typically a nano satellite small satellite cubesat is typically a, a satellite that is cube sites are typically uh, satellites that uh, uh, that are the, the, the size of a satellite is that of a tissue box so if you have a tissue box at home the satellite size is exactly that now why do people use cube sets they use cube set mainly industry universities they use cube sets for communication uh, for uh, for earth observation so that is a very important task these days so you you, you can think of uh wildfires oil spills that have happened globally disaster scenarios where these cube sats they orbit the earth on a lower scale for the leo orbit or the low earth orbit they orbit the earth at that level and they can take images and they can uh, perform other analytics on that now the problem here is these cube sats are really small as i said they 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 the size of a tissue box like this 10 cm cube you cannot put a host of processors inside the satellite itself because the satellite becomes heavy you cannot put a huge battery inside the satellite because the satellite has a weight restriction the satellite as i said is 10 cm 10 cm cube so you cannot have a big uh, solar panel on that because that will consume space so how does the satellite get the enough power to do the computations that it is supposed to do in case of satellites there is a catch 22 situation you are catching all the images you are taking all the images from say 500 kilometers above now if you are supposed to send the entire set of images back to the ground station that will consume bandwidth which in turn will consume power right so your satellites are constrained in terms of power that is the first thing about these cube satellites they are constrained in terms of power so you cannot use the entire bandwidth to push down the data to the ground station because you will go out of power if you try to do the entire computation into the in, inside the satellite you based on the current technology that is again going to be power consuming so again your satellite will run out of power so how do you deal with these things so the biggest concern in these cases is how do you do low power computation at the edge applications are like for example if you can have those smart health systems uh, human monitoring systems like smart bracelets smart fingers smart watches and all those things you cannot all the time push all your data that your smart watch is gathering back to the cloud wearable and implantable medical devices let's say i have a pacemaker inside and just okay, i have let's assume that i have a pacemaker inside now if that pacemaker has to communicate to the external servers all the time what if there is a cellular packet loss so the alerts that the that the pacemaker was supposed to send 
won't go to the hospital or the doctor. Right? Intelligent traffic lights. You cannot all the time send all your traffic camera data to the server because again, first thing, these are operated on cellular networks, which is liable to lock packet loss. So you lose reliability. Most of the time, you need a very low latency. You have to take your decision within milliseconds. If you go to the server, take the decision there and come back to the traffic camera, by that time, your uh, the, the, the car that has violated something has gone off. So you need low latency, you need high reliability. In some cases, you also need privacy. Now the thing is, you can't fit a computer or a, or a desktop or a laptop or whatever to these traffic cameras because that is going to be heavy. This is something that we talk about. This is an edge. This is an Intel neural compute stick. So I can, this, this is just the size of a USB. So I can fit this on a traffic camera and do all my computation inside this. Remember that this doesn't do, this, this won't perform any general purpose computing. What it would do is, if you have a deep learning application or a neural network that is supposed to identify parts or identify other things or read the uh, car registration number or something, you can run those neural networks safely inside this with very low power and it fits with a traffic camera as well. Uh, robotics uh, is another area in manufacturing and retail where you need these kind of devices So the, and agriculture. So the requirements in all these applications, the primary requirements are low latency. You need to answer, you need to decide very quickly as soon as you get the data within say milliseconds of getting the data. You have to do it in low power. Imagine this, this agricultural scenario. If you have sensors trying to uh, identify the, 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 the size of the crops or trying to see whether the crops are written by some, some bug or whether the crops are getting rotten or not, you'll have, you'll have millions and billions of sensors in the, in the uh, farm area, right? In the, on, the, on the field. Who is going to power all those billions of sensors? Or who is going to change the batteries of those sensors if they run out of power every seven days or so? Right? So low power is a very critical need. Reliability. As I said, cellular networks are never reliable. And you need reliability. And the last thing is, to some extent, privacy. Say I have a pacemaker or I have any smartwatch and I am sending the entire data to the cloud, to the public network. That is my personal data, my vital signals, my body vital signals are going out in the open internet. What if I can compute all those things, I can do the analytics on, on a device like this and only send out the alert. That is an inherent form of privacy. So these are the goals with which we have started working on embedding intelligence at the edge. Neuromorphic computing is one of the roots to embed intelligence at the edge. Primarily used for uh, time series processing, audio processing, video or image processing and olfactory signal processing. So this intelligence, search for intelligence, it actually began a long time ago, maybe sometime in the 1960s. So this was an article by J.C.R. Lindier in 1960. He wrote, in not too many years, Human brains and computing machines will be coupled together very tightly and the resulting partnership will think as no human brain has ever thought and process data in a way not approached by the information handling machines as we know today. That was back in 1960. Since then, the search for holy grail has continued. If you are interested in the evolution of artificial intelligence, then you'll know some of these things, how this search for the holy grail that is artificial intelligence has continued from 1950s to uh, today. So it started in 1950. The first machine learning checkers game was created. In 1954, the first successful simulation of neurons happened, McCulloch-Pitt neurons. If you have read neural, neural networks, the McCulloch-Pitt neurons were created in 1954. The first simulation happened then. 1966, the first NLP program called ELISA was created. And in fact, ELISA was in, so intelligent that it actually defeated the Turing test. It passed the Turing test, ELISA, at that time. 
1972 Shaky, the first AI robot was created. It was able to understand voice commands. 1997, landmark for us, people like us, people who are of my age. Those who were studying at college at that time, Gary Kasparov, the reigning world champion in chess, was defeated by a machine, an IBM machine called Deep Blue. That created ripples and waves in academia at that point of time. I was studying masters in computer science at JU, and this created ripples in our department. Then again in 2011, Watson, another IBM machine, defeated the three-time reigning human champion in a quiz show called Jeopardy. Maybe you have heard about this. 2011 is not too old. 2017, another recent one. This time Google. The Google AlphaGo machine defeated the reigning human champion in a game of Go. So these are the this this is the path which AI, the evolution of AI has followed. And mostly the two most intelligent paradigms that are commonly used, one is this IBM Watson and the other is deep learning. I'm sure you have heard about the term deep learning in some way, right? So let's just take a brief look at what IBM does in Watson. So it's called deep QA. So Watson is a, sorry, uh, Jeopardy is a quiz show that has been running in the US for over 25 years. It requires answering of questions that are asked in natural language, just like a quiz show, normal quiz show, whatever you see on, on the television, it's pretty much like the same quiz show. You need confidence, you need precision and answering speed to uh, get to the uh, higher levels and the clues are in different types of categories. Could be sports, could be literature, could be geography, could be politics, could be art, could be anything. So let's take an example. So one of the examples that was uh, given, one of the questions that was asked in uh, Jeopardy was, of the four countries in the world that the United States does not have diplomatic relations with, the one that is the farthest north. Now you think as a human, what I have asked, I have asked you have to name the country with which US doesn't have a diplomatic relation and that is geographically farthest north, right? What IBM did in Watson, Watson digested all kind of, all kinds of textual and visual and audio knowledge uh, repository. They digested and stored in some semantic fashion. Based on that, IBM created a, a term called lexical uh, an answer type. What is the type that you are looking for in the answer? What is the type of answer? So in this case, our LAT is countries. So I am looking for a country, right? And the keyword is the one country. There is only one country that matches my answer. So going through this, after finding out these clues, these two are the sub clues. I am looking for a country and I am looking for one country. So from there, Watson breaks the entire question into two, two sub-trees. The four countries in the world that the United States doesn't have a diplomatic relation with, Bhutan, Cuba, Iran and North Korea. That's your, that's your first part of the answer, not the whole answer. From here, Watson will have to figure out which one is the farthest north. Any guess? North Korea. How long did it take to... Uh, find out the answer? Half a second or two seconds? Watson had to digest billions and billions of gigabytes of textual data and process that to find out this answer. Right? Next one is called the deep learning paradigm. So it's called the uh, building the brain of the one algorithm hypothesis. I'll just briefly go over that. So in 1991, a couple of neuroscientists, uh, Sur and some others, Sur was a Bengali, so they did some experiments on newborn ferrets. Ferrets are animals like, 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 like uh, squirrels, small uh, size animals. So they, they did some experiments on these animals. What they did was, you see, the eye is actually connected to uh, an area inside our cortex that is called the visual cortex. And the ear 
is actually connected to an area called auditory cortex. So whatever you see, the signals go to the visual cortex for processing. Whatever you hear, the signals go to the auditory cortex for processing. Now these neuroscientists, they disconnected this nerve from the ear to the auditory cortex. Typically, you will assume that the ferrets won't, won't be able to hear it. And they connected the, the eye with the auditory cortex. So instead of the visual signals going to the visual cortex, the visual signals for the ferrets now travel to the auditory cortex. That was actually supposed to hear. Right? By default, any normal person will think that this can't work. Right? But these neonatal ferrets learn to see via their auditory cortex. From this experiment and few other similar experiments that happened across four different laboratories at almost at the same time, the neuroscientists concluded that our brain has one single algorithm irrespective of whatever task it is supposed to do. There is one algorithm running inside our brain. Depending on the type of data, whether it's visual data, whether it's auditory data, or whether it's olfactory data, the same algorithm at different areas process the data differently and come to a conclusion because of which we are able to sense things. So from this started the famed one algorithm hypothesis of deep learning and this deep learning structure that you see here, a typical uh, network architecture that people use in facial recognition that is actually based on this one algorithm hypothesis. Okay. The question here is Whatever I say till now, these systems, they seem intelligent. Are these systems really intelligent? So this question was actually asked by Professor John Searle from UC Berkeley back in 1980. So he described an argument called the Chinese room argument. That's famous even now, even debated as of today. So the Chinese room argument is like you have a room that is closed from all sides. There's only one pigeon hole in the room from where you can drop certain letters or pieces of paper. Now this person sitting inside the room, he doesn't know an iota of Chinese. He is a non-Chinese speaking person like me. Doesn't know anything about Chinese. But what he has is a huge look of table which says that if you get this Chinese symbol as input, you should write back this symbol as output. So it has a huge lookup table, the person has a huge lookup table with some Chinese input and the corresponding output. Now native Chinese speakers are asked to write something on a paper in Chinese and drop that through the pigeon hole. The task of the person sitting inside is, is to look up that those symbols that he has just received, go through the lookup table write out the uh, corresponding answers and send it back. Initially, the person will be slow because he has just started. After maybe hours or so, the person will become so efficient that given a set of Chinese symbols, he will quickly found the, find the corresponding output symbols. And the people who are outside the room, they'll start thinking that the person sitting inside is a native Chinese speaker. He really understands Chinese. Does he really understand Chinese? Did Deep Blue actually know how to play chess? Or did AlphaGo actually know how to play Go? Or let's say GPT-3, the, the computer program that wrote an article which won an award. Did GPT-3 actually know what an article is, what literature, what Shakespeare and what uh, other things, uh, literary uh, ideas are? No. It just found certain patterns. Deep Blue found a mathematical pattern in chess moves. It extrapolated those mathematical patterns and predicted some moves. AlphaGo did the same thing. Watson did the same thing. So these systems, the current artificial intelligence systems, what we call as of today, they are very good in finding patterns discovering new patterns, finding similarities be between patterns. Are they really intelligent? You can say, say, please say no. 
But even then, these systems, whatever we have today, GPT-3, Watson, deep learning systems, they're extremely important. Because they can find the answers to our problems very quickly, very precisely, and can be used at lots of places. I'm not saying that these systems, maybe they're good at uh, finding uh, lots of similar patterns. They may not be intelligent per se, but they're still very uh, helpful and very important in all our technologies, all our industri industries. But there is a hidden cost for that. The hidden cost of artificial intelligence. So when Watson was actually playing that Jeopardy game, Watson has 2,884 processor, which uh, with uh, 16 terabytes of RAM. It uses Deep Keyway on Hadoop. That's implemented on a Linux enterprise server. Uh, but when Watson runs at full throttle, it consumes 85,000 watts of energy, enough to light up the entire block of Manhattan. Cost number one. GPT-3, when it wrote that article, so OpenAI trained GPT-3 on 45 terabytes of data. And when the final training happened on Megatron LM, NVIDIA, the company which, which uh, um, manufactures the uh, graphical process, graphics processing units, they ran 512 V100 GPUs for 9 days at a stretch to train GPT-3. One single V100 consumes around 200, 250 to 300 watts. One V100 system. Nine, those 512 GPUs for 9 days consume 100, uh, 1 lakh 30 thousand watts. For 9 days, that is equivalent to 28,000 kilowatt hours. Average US household consumption is 10,650 watts, kilowatts, kilowatt hours. So think about the cost of creating one article, just one article, for training GPT-3 to write one article. Data centers, all you, all of you go to Facebook, you will upload photos, you will uh, upload photos to Facebook, to LinkedIn, to Google, whatever. So all these things are stored in data centers. People generated 64.2 zettabytes of data in 2020. That is around that, that huge number. That number of terabytes of data. And data centers need 100 megawatts of capacity Sorry, 100 megawatts of capacity that is enough to power 80,000 households in India. So, energy is effectively the hidden cost of the artificial intelligence that we talk about. And there is also a scaling problem. So, if you have followed the semiconductor industry, how, how that developed, from 1950 onwards, this went on a linear scale, more or less linear scale. So, from 1950 to 2000s, the computers that we have slowly became faster and faster and became smaller and smaller. So the algorithms that ran on the computers in 1970 with some speed x, they started running at twice or thrice the speed in 2010 or something. So the same algorithms without, maybe by just changing the, the language constructs, the same algorithms effectively started running faster on the computers that were being developed, right? So the algorithm scaled. This period, the 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 gray line that you can see, the pink line, that was actually the end of this scaling, which is called the Denard scaling. Denard scaling was the period when all our programs, the earlier older programs, started running faster on the newer computers. So Denard scaling faltered at around 2005, 2006, something like that. After that, the processing company, the processor company Intel and others, they started creating the multi-core chips. So if you see the history of the chips, 2005 and 2006, the core duo, core two duo, those systems started coming out. But again, Moore's law, there's another law in electronics started faltering, which, which governs the size of a transistor, the limits, the size of a transistor that we can reach physically. And we have already reached that stage with certain uh, fabrication companies like Global Foundries. They are saying that we cannot anymore manufacture the 7 nanometer transistor because that is too costly. We cannot match the cost. This is, this is not sustainable. So we cannot go any smaller in terms of chips. Our programs are not scaling any faster. 
because we have reached the physical size limit in terms of processing chips. But what did we get, do up to up till uh, now? So Watson answered natural language questions. GPT-3 wrote an article. You or me can recall a song that we have learned in our childhood from partial inputs or say for example Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. We have all heard it when we were a child. So if I play it on a flute, if I play it partially, if I, if I play it very poorly on any instrument, you can still recognize it. Right? And all these happen inside our brain with minimal energy consumption, close to approximately 20 watts. How? So the neuroscientists and computer scientists started asking this question, how does this happen in brain? That's brought about this paradigm shift, shift in uh, computing and AI, where we want to borrow the ideas from neuroscience into computer science and see if we can do something in a better manner. So there is a 60 second primer uh, on brain. So why do we have brains? Plants don't have brains. They lead a very stable life. Sea squirts, uh, this, this, this organism, they are born with a very rudimentary nervous system. And then they swim to the next available rock, settles there and eats the brain. After that they live quite happily. Right. So from a sensory motor perspective, from a neuroscience perspective, it, it, it says that brain, animals need a brain to move, to find food and to find partners. Brain in the neuroscience terms is, it, it produces goal directed behavior to maximize the probability of survival. So what does the brain actually do in, 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 in some specific way? It enables any creature to react to a certain specific environment. When it starts raining outside, you know instinctively that you have to take out your umbrella and open it. Right? So you can adjust to the environment. When it's sunny, you wear a sunglass or whatever it is. It analyzes the sensory representations of the environment. You can still recognize a person whom you know, whether it's raining or snowing or whether it's dark or uh, sunny. You can still recognize a person. The brain maps all these sensory perceptions to appropriate motor actions. Now let's say this photograph. You all know this, right? Anybody knows this. How long did it take to recognize this photograph? One second. Probably less than that. So our human eye, normal human eye, that has 130 million photoreceptors, the visual snapshot of, snapshot of that image was at something around 15 megabytes. We processed that information in less than a second. Now let's say if I ask a computer to do this, it will have to first figure out that, okay, this is a palace, uh, there are trees and there is a pond or something, then it will start matching this image with billions of other images available on the internet and then maybe after some, some time it will end up saying that okay, it's Victoria Memorial Hall. To do that, it had to process few thousand lines of code, right? So a computer operates in nanoseconds, a human brain operates in milliseconds. So we are slower than computers. We are always slower than computer, but we, this is the advantage. A neural processing time is 10 milliseconds for synaptic stage between neurons, but there are only 10 to 100 processing stages to recognize this kind of image. From perception to action, there are only between 10 to 100 processing stages. We don't have any algorithm that is more efficient than our algorithm still processes will have few hundred, few thousand, maybe few hundred thousand lines of code. Whereas our brains can process that in 10 to 100 synaptic stages. Now brains, we call it an anticipatory brain. Right? Because our brains are built on concepts, concepts that you have learned from your childhood. Like that twinkle twinkle little star song. You may have heard it say five times, ten times, or maybe hundred times. But that tune, that instrument, everything inside your head built a concept. You read something. Nowadays, if you read a complex paper, 
you you can you are able to read it because you have studied other reading materials you know the alphabets you know the grammar so these concepts are built inside our brain from our childhood why is it anticipated because we are very efficient or we actually walk by anticipating that is something that is going to happen let's assume you are sleeping in your room at night in sometime in the dead of night i go and lower the floor of your room by 6 inches while you were sleeping now you wake up you anticipated the floor to be at certain point of time that was built inside your brain based on these concepts i have lowered that by 6 inches what happens you fall when you fail to anticipate something you have and you face some other action right so the there are, there are different facets of biological intelligence based on this anticipation and all those things biological intelligence actual and human brains they are good in visual comprehension auditory and speech comprehension navigation and route planning decision making and we are able to do all these things with very limited amount of data let's take an example of that google uh, deep mind uh, algorithm that learned to differentiate between cats and dogs that system was trained with millions and millions of images of cats and dogs now think about yourself how many cats did your mother show you uh, till you learned to differentiate a cat maybe 5 10 that's it it did never needed billion uh, images to try and decipher between a cat and a dog but computer programs have need this kind of thing so uh let's just skip this so as i say brains are good at mapping right so all human right rather all mammals and all animals they have a built in gps inside of it so this was actually experimentally proved by uh, john o'keefe this person in uh, 1970s and then later on extended by the moser couple edward and uh, maybrick moser uh, in 1990 so what they said was our brains have certain cells that do certain things based on certain types of inputs so this is an experiment that john o'keefe ran on a rat so if you follow this rat moving inside a box those uh, white dots are places where certain of one or two uh, uh, two of its neurons are actually triggering so the neurons are getting activated at certain points so now this If, if if you uh, run the the video, uh, the, it, it it has been made faster. So you'll see that when when the rat is going at a place that it has already visited, so these places where the neurons are actually triggering are the places where it has already gone. So it knows the place. So these neurons, John O'Keefe termed these neurons as place cells. So these neurons trigger inside our brain. when i go to a place that i already know so for example uh, in your daily routine when you come to this university this institute certain neurons inside your brain trigger because you recognize the place so these are called the place cells now again uh, the 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 uh, moser uh, uh, the moser couple these these uh, they are students of uh, john o'keefe in their experiments they uh, proved that if you join the centroids of these place cells these these uh, bubbles you get a regular shape like a hexagon or a triangle that means there is always a grid inside our head there is a geometrical grid that cre- that creates that enables that mapping something like this so all what whatever thing your google map does your brain can actually do it more efficiently that is what uh, uh, these people prove now, there are other different types of special neurons border cells hey, you are sitting at the border of a room side of a room how do you know that you are sitting at the border of a room because certain cells inside your brain trigger when you are at the border of the room head direction cells which way you are looking at are governed by them speed cells at what speed you are going are governed by the speed cells so there are defined definite neurons who do certain kind of work based on the type of input 
Google used this concept to create a navigation system, learning to navigate a city without a map, just based on uh, locations or based on uh, landmarks. That's how we navigate. Right? So when we navigate inside a city that we know, uh, we we navigate based on landmarks. We know that okay, this is this is the this is future institute. This is the uh, crossing uh, where the road to Shonar to goes. This is Boria Mode. This is some X Y Z place. We know the places. We know that we have the landmarks. So that's why Google used the same concept to train their agent. There's a uh, simulation agent to train the agent on Google Street View images. They train the agent on different. Uh, street view images from different cities and the agent was then able to navigate through the city based on a land the landmarks navigate from place a to place b based on the landmarks that same thing that happened in uh, london this is london that's how the agent is moving through google, uh, using the google street view camera and they did the same thing at paris and new york so what i'm trying to say here is that the brain has certain functionalities which is which we computer scientists may be able to use or utilize in a more efficient manner. Now, often there is a very cliched argument that uh, Wright brothers didn't have to invent or didn't have to figure out how birds flew while creating the airplane. I know that this argument exists, but here we are saying that we are not going to build a brain. We are trying to learn few of the things that the brain does in a better way. Let's take an example of spikes. How do brains do these things? Let's think about this particular classroom. So it's mid-afternoon, it's 4.20, right? So you had your lunch at uh, sometime in noon, uh, and it's, you're, you're now feeling hungry, and there's a nerd speaking some random rubbish on, on the stage, and you're, you cannot go outside the room, you, have, you still have to listen to it, right? It's random rubbish. So then maybe some of your friend has brought a pack of cookies in the morning, you shared the cookie with him or her in the morning, and now you are still feeling hungry, so that cookie might uh, increase your attention. So you take a look at the cookie, uh, you feel that your mouth is watering just by looking at the cookie and then you slowly uh, move your hand forward. So at that time what happens is a buzz of electricity is going inside your brain. A huge amount of electricity that is flowing inside your brain and that is actually creating all these senses. So these, these forms of electricity, these electrical spikes, that is what powers the entire concept of neuromorphic computing. So our brain has 86 billion neurons. Out of them, 17 billion are inside the cortex and on an average, each of them trigger or send a spike once per every second. The average life expectancy of a human is around uh, 17 years or so. Right? That is more than 2 billion seconds. So 17 million spikes per second. Your lifespan, starting from your birth to all the activities that you may have done or will be doing till you become old, your th this entire lifespan is these many spikes. 34 billion billion cortical spikes. So, a spike's journey from the eye in the story that I just told while you were uh, looking at that cookie in your friend's bag, a spike's journey from the eye that receives the light bouncing from the cookie through the seeing parts of cortex turning patterns of light and shading to edges, curves, crumbs and colors of the cookie onto cortical areas for perceiving, deciding and remembering plunging into the depths of the motor system and out, out to the spine and onto the muscles, finally moving your hand to what your eye can see, a journey from seeing to deciding to moving, everything that you perceive and then act. So starting from perception to cognition to recognition to action, this whole cycle is based on journey of spikes. That is the sole thing that is important in this field of neuromorphic computing. So, how does a neuron fire? This is something a neuron looks like biologically, right? So, there's dendrite, and there's soma, and there's axon, axon. So, here in the soma, there's a cell body. If I magnify it, 
you will see in the cell body there is a cell membrane, this one, there is a cell membrane. On the outside of the cell, there is a fluid that is charged with sodium ions. So all these red bubbles are sodium ions. And inside of the cell, the green bubbles, they are potassium ions. Now because of the difference between the number of ions, obviously there is a potential difference, right? If you have x amount of charge and y amount of charge, then x minus y, there is a potential difference that will always be there. So there is a resting potential inside this cell. There is a difference between the charges outside and inside. Now somehow I stimulate the neuron with some electrical impulse. That creates a disturbance because of which these potassium cell uh, ions start moving inside the cell through these gates. These are, these are called ion channels. Through these gates, the red potassium ions start going inside. So that raises the potential difference. So the potential, that the, the voltage that was there, the standing voltage or resting potential that was there in the neuron start increasing. When it increases beyond a threshold, these potassium ions, they start going outside. They get excited and they start going outside. That again creates a difference in the potential. Again the voltage rises. So once this voltage rises and reaches a threshold, breaches a threshold, the neuron spikes. There is an electrical activity inside the neuron, like an electric shock, the neuron spikes. That spike travels to the next neuron, which again goes through this whole activity. So there is an analogy with electrical spikes. If you have studied electrical, you see that these neurons can be modeled as electrical circuits. So I am not going into the details of this. The main thing is this. Spike timing is the only important thing that matters. So let's say here, this is one neuron, this is another neuron connected to a third neuron. I have a spike at this neuron here. This spike flows to the following neuron. So I have a change in potential that rises and then decays. It's a standard potential decay that we'll often see in physics and any other science. There's one spike. Now let's imagine there is one spike here followed by another spike here. So the same potential difference goes up, starts coming down. When it's about here, the second spike arrives. So my potential rises again. The voltage rises again. But again it decays. Now let's imagine we have two spikes here, consecutive spikes here and two here. So before actually my potential actually goes and decays, goes down, I have the fourth spike coming in. My neuron reaches the threshold and this particular neuron, the, the, the post-synaptic neuron spikes, that spikes travels to the following neuron and this is how the spiking activity happens inside the neuron. Now this is the main thing in this, this particular topic, neuromorphic computing, the timing of spikes. When did it spike? We are not interested in the amplitude of spike, we are not interested in the uh, width of the spike uh, time. All we are interested in when did it spike, what was the rate of the spike. So the whole concept of neuromorphic computing is based on the spikes. It's called computing on, on, uh, with spikes or computing on spikes. The third generation of neural network, spiking neural networks. You may have heard about normal perceptrons, deep learning networks, deep neural networks, Boltzmann machine, autoencoders, XYZ, different things exist. This is a new form of neuro, uh, spike, uh, neural networks called the spiking neural networks which run on neuromorphic processors. The difference between our standard processor and neuromorphic processor is that the neuromorphic processors are architected just like mammalian brains as connections of millions of neurons and synapses. That is the major difference that gives a different spin to this full approach. Our, all our computers, this, this one or the neural compute stick that I showed you or the servers that you have in the lab or in data centers, they are all born neural machines. There is a CPU, there is a memory, you bring data from the memory to the CPU, then compute in the CPU right back to the memory, right? So when you have billions and billions of gigabytes of data traveling from the memory to the CPU, you obviously 
is going to overload the spots that connects the CPU and the memory. That causes heat. To, to, to disperse that heat, you have to run the coolers in the processor. The whole thing consumes power. So this is a cycle. The more data you have, the more data you try to process, you have you are actually flooding that data bus on a von Neumann machine and you are consuming power. This is typically called the von Neumann bottleneck. VNB. There is a sole reason neuromorphic computing has been created to counter the effects of von Neumann bottleneck. So the neuromorphic process where we have connections of neurons and synapses, the neurons process the data and the synapse store the intermediate values. So processing and storage is in fact co-located. There is not much distance to travel. So there is no data overload. The neurons in this case are bio, more bioplausible. So as opposed to the perceptron networks, uh, we use more bioplausible neurons like leaky integrated fire, EGK, which Hodgkin, Hodgkin. These are modeled on real neurons, right? And spike is the simplest possible temporal message or event. Effectively, something like this. This is what our input is. In spiking neural network, this is the input that we use. Whether it's an image, whether it's a video, whether it's audio, this is what the input is uh, looks like and that is how a series of input is created and we use this for processing. So there are different neuromorphic platforms under research right now. Uh, IBM has something called TrueNot, not commercially available. Spinnaker is a huge uh, neuromorphic computing system, rather a supercomputer from University of Manchester. It's part of the Human Brain Project. Uh, BrainScale-S is another neuromorphic computer from University of Heidelberg, again part of the Human Brain Project. Intel Loihi, the most popular one and most likely to come out in the market in the next two, three years, is a, a neuromorphic system that has a form factor starting from a size of a USB to 64 core machines. So that is where you know, uh, Intel are working at. There are small companies like Spikey uh, from Heidelberg, Neurograde, Xerox from Qualcomm. Uh, they are also working on neuromorphic chips. Uh, this is what Intel says is their view on neuromorphic. So spiking neural networks and neuromorphic systems is actually a marriage of neuroscience, machine learning and uh, competitive computer architectures. So you have to mix all the knowledges of all these things. And the type of problems that we are working on, deep learning problems, object identification, video identification, uh, image identification, all these kind of things, uh, mathemat mathematical optimization problems like uh, traveling salesman problem, vehicle routing problem that you write, uh, read in computer science, in, uh, maybe in uh, OR and other subjects, and robotics is another area where these kind of systems are. What this implies for the technology outlook, so we believe that uh, this is why, what we are uh, uh, trying to find out, this is, this is what uh, Intel is trying to uh, produce. So one is uh, trying to create a general purpose neuromorphic computer uh, that can be scaled up to uh, big data centers or use event-based sensing, but this is the main focus of the type of work that we do in our research in our lab my team does on edge computing. So embedding intelligence at the edge with low power consumption, that is something that uh, these neuromorphic chips are probably going to enable. This is some ben benchmarking information that you can, uh, it's from a public domain paper, so you can uh, always take a look and verify. So this is what they tried in, in uh, with Intel OET. So you know this uh, Hey Siri or make up uh, OK Google, you have these things on your phone, right? So you, you can always use these voice commands to do something. So this experiment is a keyword spotting experiment on a real audio stream. They ran these examples on uh, Intel OEG, Mobidius, in, uh, the, the neural compute stick, this, this, this device, and uh, uh, NVIDIA Jetson normal CPUs and GPUs. So in all these platforms, the same experiments were run and you can actually see this is the power consumption of neuromorphic systems, this one. NVIDIA, the, sorry, the Movidia's compute, compute stick around five times more than uh, Loini and the CPUs and GPUs, they are at least a hundred or more times. 
So the benefit of these neuromorphic systems is you end up uh, consuming less than 100 times or sometimes 1000 times less power compared to normal uh, computing systems. This is the one last example that I will show you. This is how actually we see, right? This may uh, seem odd, but this is uh, how a represent, visual representation of, cat, of a cat is formed inside our brain. This was actually created by these two uh, people, Carver Mead and Misha Mawal, back in 1994. They created something called a silicon retina, based on how mammals actually see, how the, the light from the object that you, you are seeing is converted into spikes and how those spikes create an impression of the object inside our brain is actually given by this. And a live uh, demonstration of this, this kind of uh, um, vision sensing system, the silicon camera is something like this. This is a person sitting in front of a camera and moving his hand in front of a camera. So actually, these event-based event, event -based cameras, what they do is, compared to traditional cameras, they don't capture the entire frame. So take a typical camera, your mobile camera or the camera that you, uh, any, any video camera, they will take the pixels starting from this corner to that corner. They'll record every pixel. Irrespective of the intensity, the luminous intensity of the pixel, they'll record everything. These event-based cameras, they only record the change in luminosity at a given pixel at a given time. So there's a person moving his hand in front of the camera, so you have a change in luminosity. At certain pixels in the frame, only those changes are recorded. If that person sits dead still without doing anything, this camera won't record anything. So basically, all that happens inside our brain is based on those events that come to the brain. So when we see things, it is because something, some, there is some change in luminosity, somewhere. Those signals come to our, through our eye, to our brain, that's what we capture and that's what, how, that's what, how a cat looks like this inside our brain. So based on this, we did a real, uh, created a real application. Uh, gesture recognition by robots. Why is it required in assistive robotics, in affective robotics, or in warehouses or uh, retail centers where you have robots with human co-workers? You need, your robot or whatever that, that entity is needs to be able to understand your gestures, right? whether you are calling it or whether you are asking, to, asking it to move right or left or go straight. Those robots need to understand your gestures. So based on that, that, that requirement, we created a, uh, a demo joint with a company called BrainChip, uh, who are building a system called Akira, a neuromorphic system. This was demonstrated at Murips 2019. So let's, you can skip the initial part. So this is this is this is how the uh, BrainChip Akira platform looks like. Uh, this is the development environment. Uh, these things are out. So this, this is more important. So what we are trying to do is teach a robot to recognize these gestures and do it online. I am not, uh, unlike Google, that those cats and dogs uh, identification system, I am not going to show the robot 10,000 images of turn right 20,000 images of turn left, I'm not going to do that. What I want is, what I need is, the robot should be able to learn these gestures as quickly as possible with as minimal data as input and perform based on that. So, this is the setup that we use, a DBS camera. And this is the kind of network that we use, and uh, there's no need to go into the uh, details of this. So, this is where the fun bit is. So at the training phase, when we are training the system, there will be a person who is doing certain hand gestures in front of a DBS camera. He will do it only for a short time. Within that time, the robot will learn the gesture and perform something. So 
this is one finger, the, the, the robotic avatar, this is in simulation, is supposed to move forward. So that person is performing that gesture in front of a previous camera, two to three seconds. And in one shot, unlike those millions and uh, images of cats and dogs, in one shot, the robot learns to recognize that gesture. This is gesture number two. The robot is supposed to move backward. Again, two to three seconds, Robot, the robot learns the new gesture, goes backward. Number three, it has to turn right. Again, the gesture is performed live. And it turns right. Turn left. That is all the training that we need. After that, in the testing phase, any person, doesn't have to be that person, any person, you or me or anyone, can perform the same gestures in any random sequence, doesn't have to be in the same sequence, can perform the same gestures in front of the camera, the robot will do the tasks, perform the tasks it has learned to perform. So effectively, it took just two to three seconds to teach the robot how to recognize a gesture. This is called online learning, unlike uh, using those millions and millions of uh, volume, uh, gigabytes of training data to teach a system, uh, to teach a network to learn or recognize certain things. Here we do it in, online in two to three seconds that is called one shot learning. So, what do we do actually? We use DBS input with hand gestures being performed in front of a DBS 128 camera. We use on-chip real-time learning. No pre-training, no huge volume of training data, no need of labeled training data and all those things, no data engineering, uh, no data cleansing or anything. Just a person performs those gestures live in front of the camera. The network learns the gesture in three to five seconds. Accuracy somewhere around 90-95% accuracy. Power consumption, that is the most inter interesting part. So, average number of events that was processed for a DBS 128 cross 128 input was around 200,000 events. The power consumption was 3 milliwatts. If you use a low resolution camera, 64 by 64 uh, resolution camera, the power consumption is even less, 1 milliwatt. Effectively, the power consumption that a pneumorphic system can promise is somewhere around 0 .001, 0 0.001 times that of conventional deep learning systems. So that's where we are at right now. Uh, these are the things type of work that we do, spike encoding. Uh, that, that, that this is important because as, as, as you have already may have guessed that these spiking neural networks, they are dependent on spikes. All my real value data, images, videos, they are not in the spike domain. So we have to convert an image or a video into that spike domain. DBS does it by itself. DBS is already in the event domain or spike domain. For the rest, we have to create this converter. We are working on different types of neural models and new network architectures, specifically targeted for action gesture recognition necessary for robotics, time series processing in manufacturing, uh, cloud cover detection in space tech and satellites and we are also trying to create a neuromorphic platform on hardware. This is my team, current team that is working on the spiking neural network area. Uh, so that's it. Good afternoon, sir. Thank you for your presentation. It was a very uh, innovative and interactive report. My question to you is: You told us about spy. So, how is the artificial neural network? Please keep silent. So, my question to you is: uh, You told us about spy. So, how in an artificial neural network we can develop spy? 
Okay, so uh, this was the last thing that I mentioned. So any real value data, image, time series, video, these are not in spike domains, right? So neuromorphic uh, systems running spiking neural networks, they are dependent on these spikes, just like a mammalian brain does. We have to use an encoder that converts the real value data into spikes, just like that DBS system does. The DBS camera it doesn't record all the frames. It records only the change in luminosity at a certain pixel at a given point of time. That is the spike information in a visual way. Similarly, we can convert different types of data, even time series or audio or video into spikes using Poison or Gaussian, different forms of encoding that exist based on which we can create real, convert real value data into spikes which is consumed by spiking in our and why does neuromorphic systems consume less power? Number so the first reason is that not, they are non one neural systems because processing and memory is co-located. Number one. Number two is processing is inherently sparse. Because we are dealing with spikes, we are not dealing with continuous real value data, we are dealing with spikes, processing is inherently sparse. I process only when there is an event. Otherwise, I don't do it. Same thing happens from, for the DBS camera. I capture the information only when there is a movement, there is a change in luminosity, otherwise I don't do anything. So my energy consumption is less. I have a question. Yeah. So, um, as an application of uh, embedding intelligence, how many sensors and what kind of sensors do smart shoes have? Uh, smart smart shoes, I... Uh, okay, was it from that image? Yes, sir. Yeah. So, something can be based on uh, your weight, tracking your weight, tracking your balance. Tracking your balance can actually uh, say important or give you important information about your gait. Gait means the way you are walking, whether it's in correct posture or not. Often, we uh, get to problems on our knee or ankle because of incorrect postures. So these smart shoes, they can tell you about whether you are walking correct in a correct posture or not, whether your gait is perfect or not. Or, if there is some problem in the gait, whether it's a long-term health-related thing or not, you can get those, get those information. Thank you, sir. Good evening, sir. I have a question. Means uh, it may be very trivial. Maybe I couldn't understand, but still. What? Quite please. Uh, basically, what I have gathered. Again, I'm telling you, I may be wrong. You are uh, detecting the spikes, and if I'm not wrong, it's a time series data because it's temporal, it's temporal in nature. Then, uh, where is the role of the say deep learning algorithm? I briefly saw one of the uh, slides having CNA. My question is yeah, that so why you are not using Dorima, Adima, those forecasting okay. algorithms in contrast yeah. to the CNN? We are not actually using CNA. Right. So see that 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 slide had a uh, I think you are talking about this one. Yes, yes. Yeah. So this is CSF. No, Conf no. Conf yeah, yeah. Not this one, there was a slide on CNN. If you just briefly skip it, maybe uh, I saw it. Yeah, this one, right? No, no, no. <coughs> Not the previous one. Go next. Go next. Yeah, yeah, maybe this one. Oh. This is what a traditional deep learning system uses. So I actually skipped it because um, I didn't think that you'll find any interest in this. 
This is how the CNN for face recognition was modeled on neuroscience uh, concepts. So basically what it says is humans and other apes, uh, monkeys and uh, things like that, they have special areas inside the brain called the fusiform face area. Right. What happens in this case is, even in the deep learning face recognition case, that was uh, designed by the deep learning team like Andrew Ensign. So at every layer, you detect certain features, right? So the first layer, you probably detect uh, the edge, these kind of edges of the face, maybe your lips, maybe your nose, maybe your eyebrows. So those edges are detected. Then in the second layer, those edges are combined. So you go to a more abstract level. The edges are combined and you detect features like the eye. Instead of the eyebrow, and the eye as a separate two edges, you have combined them to detect the eye or maybe the nose and the eye together. So you go to a more abstract level. On the third layer, you start getting more abstract levels of the face. So in fact, in the human brain or in apes brain, this fusiform face area, they have six patches of neurons. Each are related to finding certain abstract level of features from a face. Now the funny thing here is, this fusiform face area or FFA, these neurons, they only get activated when you see a face. You see a button, this, it finally tells you that okay, I have seen this face before. So that is what I wanted to say here, which I skipped. Anyway, so this, this uses CN. This, 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 this facial detection, face recognition system, they use CN. In case of neuromorphic systems, Spiking neural networks are not modeled really as CNNs or uh, say autoencoders or Boltzmann machines. They are typically different, radical, uh, rather say radically different, but neural networks which operate on spikes. There are certain pros and cons. Obviously, you have gained that we, we operate with uh, SNNs operate on uh, less volume of data. They operate less uh, based on events, so they are sparse in nature. Uh, they consume less power. There are certain problems uh, which exist. For example, back propagation. I think you all know is a very important area in neural network, right? Back propagation doesn't happen on SNNs. Why not? Because SNNs deal on spikes. Back back propagation uses differentiation. How do you differentiate a spike? It's not differentiated. So we have that is yet to achieve is a synaptic plasticity. Synaptic plasticity means in, in uh, neuroscience terms, in heavy learning terms, we, we call it something called, there is a, a saying, neurons that fire together, wire together. That's a very uh, famous saying in heavy learning. It means, first time you see an apple, somebody tells you, okay, it's an apple. There is a circuit of neurons that forms in your inside your brain. Preliminary circuit. Looks like this, this is apple. Second time you see an apple, the same circuit fires again. They wire together. They become stronger. The bond between the neurons becomes stronger. So whenever you see something that you have already seen before, or something that you already know before, remember these concepts? Whenever these concepts are created based on that same neurons that wire to fire together, wire together. Gone. Unless you store the whole memory in some silicon system. That means you are going back to the same von Neumann problem. To store your uh, synaptic uh, values or, or, or to store your uh, synaptic plasticity for long term memory, you are going back to the same von Neumann problem. So that is yet to be achieved. Okay, when, when I uh, showed these systems, yeah, when I showed these systems, one of the things that these people are working on is different types of materials to create the chips. Memory stirs, uh, phase change memory, resistive ramps, ferroelectric devices, these special kind of materials, they have a property that when, when you create a resistance in them, even if you switch it off, the resistive value remains stored. 
that may be an area which can be exploited to create these new versions of the chip which can have this synaptic plasticity. Switch it off, your memory still remains. You go to sleep, your memory is intact. Any more questions? Thank you very much, sir, for sharing your deep knowledge about neuromorphic computing. Your kind presence not only attracted a great strength of participants, but also kept everyone amused with deep insights on topic of your talk. And this concise talk shaped insights on a future technology trend apart from computer science engineering to neuromorphic computing. It was great experience having you at our national seminar. Thank you very much sir for your valuable time. Now I request Dr. Anirvan Chakraborty, Head of the Department of Computer Application Department to present a small token of appreciation to Dr. Arjit Mukherjee. I express my sincere and most revered gratitude to the management of Team Future for their immense support in motivating us to organize this event as a part of the Future Plus Plus lecture series. Special thanks to respected Mr. Shilajit Hosser, Chairman Team Future, Dr. Moshmi Ghosh Madam, Founder Director Team Future and our inspirational guardian, our very own respected executive director, Dr. Alok Kumar Bhosar, for his gracious present, presence and support. This event was planned in a student-centric approach to guide them in their future career opportunities and help them in finding the right avenues open for them. 
Yesterday, on 7th April, we had two events mainly to celebrate the success stories of the students of Information Technology Department. In this regard, I am honored to congratulate the entire team of the Department of Information Technology. Our sincere thanks to Ms. Pooja Roy Gongopadhyay Madam, Head Corporate Communications and Relations for her illuminating session on campus placement. We are indeed grateful to Professor Tapos Roy, Head Computer in Science and Engineering Department, Dr. Onirvan Chakraborty, Head Computer Application Department, and Professor Proshenjit Mukherjee, Assistant Professor IT Department, for their valuable insights during the panel discussion entitled this panel discussion was incomplete without the support of the students who were the actual enlighters of this event. I feel extremely happy to congratulate the galaxy of sparking starts from the IT department for sharing their invaluable experience for the preparation of placement drive. Mr. Sarfaraz Ahmed, Ms. Janavi Oja, Mr. Shomaria Samanto, Mr. Devdeep Sharkar, Mr. Oviruk Ghosh, and Ms. Sweta Shikha. All six of you have been outstanding during the panel. All six of you, along with all other students of IT department, have been highly successful in setting a bar for your juniors. This event will surely motivate to all of your juniors across all disciplines to carry the enriching legacy forward in the coming days. The technical sessions held today, that is on 8th April, gave us the opportunity to listen from the stalwarts of the industry. I feel elated in congratulating the team of computer application, BCA and MCA department for organizing such an enterprising event today. <laughs> On behalf of the organizing committee, I express my deepest gratitude to the honorable speakers for accepting our invitation. I convey my humble appreciation to Mr. Shorji Bhattacharya, Senior Solution Architect of Mindtree, for his in-depth session on Big Data Engineering and the Use of Spark. <laughs> we were blessed to have the presence of Mr. Partho Sarkar, <laughs> Academic Relationship Manager, Tata Consultancy Services, and the highly valuable session on Neuromorphic Computing presented by Dr. Aurijit Mukherjee, Senior Scientist. The session by Mr. Rahul Singh, Technical Architect, Blue Vector AI, and our very own BC alumnus, 2015-18 batch, turned out to be highly motivational in igniting the thoughts of entrepreneurship among the students. Wish you all the very best, Rahul, in your future endeavors. The event was not possible without the support of the volunteer students, teachers, and staff members of IT and CA department. A huge congratulations to all the members for making this event a grand success. Thanks to the anchor, Professor Ishani Das of IT Department, <laughs> Dr. Monalisa Ghosh and Professor Monomna Banerjee from CA Department <laughs> for hosting the, all the sessions on the tool. Thanks to the System Department headed by Mr. Tapos Banerjee for their immense support. Big thanks also to the admin department for helping us in arranging this event. 
acknowledge our input of electrician staff and housekeeping staff for their support. We appreciate the joint convenance, Professor Orindam Shinaraj, Professor Nila Shinaraj Doctor of IT Department, Professor Ashok Kurupal and Professor Indrani Shah from the Department. But before we finally conclude, it would be incomplete for all of us without acknowledging the relentless Herculean efforts of the conveners of this today's seminar. Officer Prashinjit Basu, head IT department, and Dr. Anirvan Kapoorji, head CA department. Sir, without your dedication, this event couldn't have been arranged with such immaculate precision. Probably I am missing one person to acknowledge. And I believe without the 3D between TXR and that person, the grand success of this event was not possible at all. Let's have a big round of applause for Professor Santamura. It, it was not scripted to me. Last but definitely not the least, we must thank our sponsors, Mr. Rajamun Deshwarkar, Director of Ardent Computer Science. Dr. Dr. Sarmoli Ganguly and Mr. Sumanto Prokash Rai of Kopai Pan Dila Resort Shanti and Sakon Kumar Govinda of Goya. So finally, let's have another big round of applause to acknowledge the efforts of the entire team of Future Plus Plus. So, we would like to meet you all very soon on April 11 with our fourth event of Future Plus Plus Lecture Series. Till then, that's all we have for today. Thank you very much. And, uh, and we happy birthday for our PTSR HOD IT department. And we happy returns of the day. A very good night to all of you.